You do some shoulder stretch at some point in this stream. Uh, so, like, I don't know, like an hour or something. Somebody remind, in an hour, somebody tell me to get my ass up and do some shoulder stretches. Uh, yeah, I'll take it. Um, hey, Rumble. Ugh. Just to just just literally chug that fucking drink right before I I sat down. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Zippy. These days, all I'm doing is fucking buzzing the sides and the back, and um, fucking taking like thinning shears to the top. That's all I'm doing is fucking thinning shears and like add some texture to the top and fucking taking down the sides. Um, so, oh, all right. Um, uh, cancel, cancel, cancel. Jesus Christ. Misclick, misclick. All right. Thank you, Karina. Um, I'm sore. My shoulders are a mess. I wish I could get my fucking shoulders straightened out. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see my, uh, my physio. Um, I, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I see for shit like this from every time, every few years. And so I'm gonna get him to lay a plan out for my shoulders so I can keep lifting and shit like that. Um, also they're getting in the way of other stuff, right? Like they get in the way of my core work. Oh, Jesus Christ. That, that amylopectin just hit me. Um, cause I can't do like planks and shit. I can't like load the shoulder. So it's getting in the way of my core work. Um, let's see. Oh, 
Fuck your non-granular controls. All right. Oh, is there anything fucking? Because I took yesterday off. Ugh. Is there anything we need to talk about? I don't think there was anything like I mean that needs to be talking about. Um. I just don't. I don't feel the music. I uh, vey. Uh, fucking Travis Scott has a ten billion dollar lawsuit against him and the various fucking people associated with that stupid concert. Ten billion dollar lawsuit. Oof. Um, is that lady who's all spiritual and thinks Hitler's in heaven? Yeah, I saw that. Somebody was it you that posted that, Rev? That like fucking a. Uh, when when spirituality goes wrong, right? Like that's. That's what that's all about. Oh, fucking A. Just dumbest fucking take ever. People chose the path that they're going to walk in this life. So if they died in the Holocaust, that was their own choosing from the spirit realm. Hitler's in heaven. All right. Look, yeah, we're not allowed to advocate violence, but occasionally somebody needs a smack upside the head just to just to get them back on track a little bit. Right. Occasionally, somebody just needs a smack upside the head. Just, to, you know, shake it a little loose. Prime candidate. Prime fucking candidate for a smack upside the head. Just to get them back on track. Um, came up to my aunt after Pilates today to explain why I was struggling so hard. She was super supportive and happy for me. It opened my aunt's eyes to how good this could be and started calling me Karina. And then there in the conversation, I nearly cried smiling. That's... That's that's sweet, Karina. I'm glad your aunt is uh, more on board than some of your other people. Let's just put it that way. Uh, she's a PhD in psychology. Wait, that bitch is a PhD in psychology. The the fucking the fucking spirituality Hitler's in heaven fucking broad is she got a PhD in psych? God damn it, fucking people are stupid. I love it. Oh, that's amazing. Christopher Reeves chose to fall off that horse. Exactly. Um, Mom even was like, okay, maybe it is me and especially dad who's struggling. Yeah. Well, get with the fucking program. Um, can you fake it for a PhD? Whether you'd be surprised, some of the dumbest motherfuckers on the planet have a P have highly specialized fields, right? Um, dude, who is it? Which which one's the neurosurgeon? He's my classic prime go-to example. Is that? It's not Ben Carson, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Ben Carson, right? Fucking brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so it is Ben Carson, brilliant pediatric neurosurgeon, right? Like. Top of his field. Legitimately. Just everywhere else, he's fuck shit. He's fucking, dude, is so dumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pyramids are the grain storage, dude. Oh, fuck, man. He is so dumb. Right? Like, that's the thing. You can be highly specialized and very well accomplished in a field. It doesn't mean you have, like, intelligence outside that field. Ben Carson's a prime example. Um... So, oh, uh, wait, I wonder what country this is. Hang on. Finland. Ah, Finland. Um, Um, it's a speed world. Oh, is there anything? You know what? Let me check. Check the shit I had saved. Um. Is this? Yeah, this is this year. Um. Hang on. You're gonna you guys are gonna love this. You guys are gonna love this.
they're trying to cancel Ebenezer Scrooge. I'm not shitting you. I'm not shitting you. Hey. <laughs> hey, Lexi. Um, they're trying to cancel Ebenezer. Uh, for being for being woke. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're right. The conservatives are coming for Ebenezer now. <laughs> woke Ebenezer Scrooge begins his descent into the realm of the woke. Wokery is nothing new, and for that we can blame Charles Dickens. A Christmas carol has poisoned the minds of the snowflake generation into believing there's something wrong with owning many properties. Oh. Oh. Uh. Yep. Yeah, Charles Dickens, that infamous fucking. Uh. Oh, I think I, I don't think I was on the air when I think I mentioned this to somebody on a voice call. So here you go. Here's another great one. Honolulu police use a robot uh, uh, dog to patrol a homeless encampment. Local police use $150,000 in COVID relief funds to purchase Boston Dynamics four-legged robot spot. Cyberpunk 2077. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh. Oh, and here's here's actually something like I mean I don't usually do like hopeful stories, but here's like Yeah, I know, right, Rev? Um Fusion Milestone. First time they generated more energy than was absorbed by the fuel. Um, so National Ignition Laboratory at Lawrence Livermore. Um, yep. First fucking time somebody's managed to make this work. Progress is progress, though. Progress is pro progress. If we can get a fucking, uh, if we could get a fusion reaction going, I mean, one. You know, yeah. Who are Bot who are the Botez sisters? Can somebody answer me this question? Who the fuck are the Botez sisters? Do do any of my people know who the fuck I'm talking about? Cause I sure as fuck don't know who I'm talking about. They're chess streamers. They're high-level players, but not professionally competitive, if I recall correctly. Thank you, Chew Toy. Um, chess playing sisters. Okay, they're chess chess playing sisters. All right. Well, let's watch a clip of the Botez uh, Botez sisters. Um, in this clip, well, um. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea who they were. Okay, Andrea, your turn to ask a question. Uh, okay, okay no, here's all I'm trying to say. Um, we're in Dubai, so we're not going to say, you know, anything in particular about this country. We're the only women. thing, the only thing that bothers me is when people from uh, first world or developed countries shit on, you know, developing countries for doing things that those developed countries also did in the first place. It's just, you know, a little bit of, of ignorance. Um, that's all. Not to say that we support Nest. Again, we will have I some conversation when we're back in the U.S. about the mass incarceration system in the United States, but I won't. But it's very okay. funny that you guys, okay. I'm not going. I'm not going. I just have, I have a, no, I'm very good at, at holding back. Okay. That was in response to a question about slavery in Dubai. They just what abouted slavery in in modern day Dubai. That what aboutism? 
Like that's what that was in direct response to. Somebody in their chat asked about why are you in um, Dubai if there uh, if there's such a problem? <laughs> yeah, they they what about um slavery in Dubai? That's that's literally what the question was about. So you know, that's that's I had no idea who the fuck they were. I just I just had this clip of like a couple of uh, sisters apparently defending slavery in Dubai. I was like, oh, all right, well that's fascinating. I'll ask somebody else who they are. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Wither, do you not know that Dubai is like a nightmare shithole for like immigrants, like? Who do somebody somebody else will be like more educated on this than me? But who's Dubai's slaves? Is, is it still India or is it somewhere else? Because I know for a while it was like Indian subcontinent, but Southeast Asian. Okay, Southeast Asia. I uh, forget which country specifically. Yeah, I don't I don't remember. But Dubai imports slaves though. Like straight up, they import slaves. Like that, and I'm not, I'm not going to mince words here. Like slaves. Yeah. So yeah, that's, it, it's, it's a thing. Like, look, we have abusive practices and 13th amendment. Look, I did this last week, right? <clears throat> we got problems, but don't downplay those problems either. Right? Like this is fucked up. Mass incarceration, fucking 1% of the, you know, total population, fucking 13th of men. Look, I've done the spiel. I've got it on fucking record at this point, right? Um, but don't what about is it? Right? Like, Dubai uses, like, modern day active slavery. So. Um, like, straight up. I remember a story about some employer in Dubai murdering an immigrant employee. I remember so many fucking stories like that. Um, <coughs> <coughs> there was one of them um, that tried to jump out a window and kill herself. And, like, the fucking, like, I, I don't even remember what happened. Like, I don't even remember what happened. It was something like, fuck, the, the, one of the women or somebody, like, grabbed her wrist or something and tried to prevent her from jumping because they didn't want the negative attention from the press or some shit like that. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, they have, they have, like, little servant slave girls that they import from abroad and shit like that. And the construction companies import men from abroad to build their shit. And they just huck themselves off of fucking high places on a fairly regular basis because, well, living as a slave in Dubai is a nightmare. So, you know. Um. All right, weather. Wage slavery to the extreme. Yeah, it's just hyperpotent and capism. Um. Oh, oh God. All right, here, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna pause the fucking background music. Let's just do this. This is gonna be a thing. It's gonna be a thing. It's gonna be a thing. It's gonna be a thing. I'm sorry um, in advance for making you listen to this. Hum I think, I think he's a human being. I think he's a human being. <sighs> I think he's a human being. I think we have to claim this one. I think this one's on us. Um. <laughs> Madam Speaker, imagine you've just walked out of this chamber and outside is a gorgeous sunset. You have a Polaroid camera and you snap a beautiful picture and the gray photo prints out the front. You hold it and shake it, waiting for the picture to appear. But suddenly someone walks by and snatches your photo, ripping it to shreds. You're stunned. You cry, why did you destroy my foot, my picture? The person replies, oh, it wasn't a picture. It wasn't fully developed yet. All of us in this room realize how asinine that reasoning is. That photo was transforming into a beautiful image. This illustration by Seth Gruber is simple, but it's what our nation has done to the most precious image of all, the image of God. Madam Speaker, a silent genocide has slipped beneath the conscience of America. Precious works of our Creator formed and set apart meet death.
before they breathed life. Eternal souls woven into earthen vessels, sanctified by Almighty God and endowed with the miracle of life, are denied their birth by a nation that was born in freedom. God's breath of life blown away by the breath of man. This cruel and fallen world may seem too filthy for their very presence, but these precious temples are crafted in the image of God himself. One day, perhaps when science darkens the soul of the left, our nation will repent. But until then, the carnage of this unconscionable deed will stain the fabric of our nation. I hope that the Supreme Court overturns Roe v. Wade. I hope that we stop the, uh, the genocide of abortion in this country. With that, I yield back. Now, I have a moral question for you. <sighs> he has some sort of spinal cord injury. That man is in a wheelchair, right? The first thing that popped into my head was like, I hope somebody fucking puts blocks in front of his wheelchair, <laughs> right? Like, or puts chocks in front of his wheel wheelchair, <laughs> right? Like we could just stop him from being a problem by putting some chocks in front of his wheelchair wheels. Like, oh, did, did, did Madison not make it to the vote? Oh, did Madison not make it to the floor to give his speech? Interesting. I wonder what could have... <clears throat> <laughs> Throw a stick in the spokes. I know, right? Like, can we just... I'm just saying, like... I can't, I can't kick him in the knee. That ain't gonna do shit. Um... Throw a... Hey, Puka. Put a, put a fucking clamp on the wheelchair. Yeah. Oh... Uh, <laughs> Matt can be in a wheelchair soon. <laughs> Stranger things. Uh, oh, I just... An earthen vessel sanctified by Almighty God. Science darkening the soul of the left. I... I I just want to take his wheels. <laughs> I just want to take his wheels. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe it's ableist. Maybe it's something, right? Like, I just want to make his life uncom more uncomfortable than it already is. How dare you? How dare you, sir? Fucking earthen vessels sanctified by almighty God and science darkening the souls of the left. Because no conservative has ever been a scientist. Right? Like, there's never been a Republican scientist. There's never been somebody who's been on the, the, the conservative side of, uh, of a political compass or a political spectrum that has been involved in scientific fields whatsoever. That's solely the left who's at fucking... I, it just, there's so much wrong with that. By the way, have you seen his signature? He doesn't know how to spell his own name. He doesn't know how to spell his own name. He doesn't know how to spell his own name i'm not kidding you um hang on let me try and let me try and find it okay so everybody like Okay, so a bunch of people were like, oh my God, this is mockery and ableism and all these sorts of things, right? And people, like, a bunch of people posted the signature. One dude, this dude posted it to, to Twitter and people came in hard and fast. They're like, this is ableism. He's got a spinal disorder. Of course he can't write his name very well. People thought they were being, the, the people thought they were making fun of him for having bad handwriting. Look at the typed name and then look at the, the the name he has written. Okay? Pay attention to the last name. This is an ableism. This motherfucker can't spell his own name. 
Yeah. Yeah, Astral. Like, yeah, and even the non-native English speakers are like, that's not what that spells. <laughs> yes. Madison Cawthorn, C-A-W-T-H-O-R-N, spells his name when written C-A-U-T-H-O-N. So, Astral, I've looked at this. I've looked at this. This isn't a run-on, right? Like, this isn't a run-on. Um, this is a, This is specifically an A. Up, over, and up. Duh, duh, U, T, H, O, N. There's no, there's no even, like, yeah. Like, this, this motherfucker can't spell his own goddamn last name, right? Who, who would have guessed the guy that thinks science has darkened the souls of the left and that women are earthenware vessels sanctified by the almighty God can't even spell his own goddamn last name? Is this motherfucker, like, functionally illiterate? Is that is that what I'm is that what I'm to assume is that Madison Cawthorn is functionally illiterate because he can't even spell his own goddamn last name? Like, has anybody given this dude a literacy test in his life? Do we know is he actually illiterate? Because that's what my suspicion would be. Oh, technically you can, Chew Toy. Technically you you could you could. I, I'm pretty sure that's a possibility. Um, probably his parents might have paid for his education. Yeah, somebody was mentioning that he's got money. So, um, either way, um, oh, so I've got a fun new statistic for you, right? So everyone knows the 1350 right we always put up with the fucking 1350 in certain circles uh, that's true Crix. that's true um everybody knows the 1350 statistic right we all we all know that one um well i have a new statistic for you you're gonna love it you're gonna love it here's here's what you get to reply back with Despite making up just 0.3% of the population, police account for 8% of all homicides against men in the United States of America. 0.38%. So just so you know, I think it's an important statistic to uh, be able to cite. <laughs> oh... Feel free, have fun, enjoy, use it. I feel endangered by the police, no further comment. Isn't that kind of logical since their job involves violence? Do I need to do the police statistics numbers again? Um, police don't have a dangerous job. They don't have a particularly violent job. They make it violent. Um, and, um, hey Jeff, um, I have an essay. I have uh, I've covered it multiple times. It's a, there's an independent video on YouTube. Even um, they quite literally do not have a dangerous job. Um, the violence is largely self-derived involving police, um, and this is based off their own statistics. 
Like this isn't some like leftist think tank sort of thing. I use the National uh, Police Officer Memorial Fund um, for the basis for this analysis. The fact of the matter is, is that 0.0058% of police um, actually are killed by violent means uh, in the line of duty. Sure, attacks happen a little more often than that, but I mean that's not a that's not a, sh a, a, a decimal place error. By the way, you're like, oh, maybe it's 0.58 percent. No, no, I haven't forgotten to move the decimal place. 0.0058 percent of police, at least in 2019. The numbers are higher now because of COVID. COVID's killing cops, by the way. That's that's the number one threat to police in America, 100 percent. The number one threat to police by by miles in America is COVID. COVID has killed more cops than any other thing in recent memory. That's it's it's being a cop is legitimately kind of dangerous right now because of COVID, but not because of COVID, but because of their refusal to wear masks and their refusal to get vaccinations. So that's on them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite literally not a very violent or dangerous job. Um, for the most part, it's, it's non-confrontational tax, a random taxation of the public. Um, and then they escalate incidents themselves. By and large, most of the violent encounters that police encounter, they fail to de-escalate. So at the end of the day, whoops. <clears throat> um, Jap, I can for 125 to 175 dollars, I can buy the answers to the um, psych exam for the uh, entrance ex uh, examination to the police academy in the United States of America. I can buy the answers. Yeah. Um, there's a lot. There's got to be a logical. Yes. It's a position of authority and power that is unchecked. What type of personality do you think is attracted to that job? Right? If uh, Let's forget cops. Forget society. Just uh, hypothetical. I've got a job here that's going to pay really well, has basically no accountability, allows you to have power that you laud over the other members of your community and your society. And if you have a da bad day, you can just smack the fuck out of somebody if you want. What type of personality do you think that's going to attract? Oh, also, what are the requirements to get in? Is it like a four-year or like an eight-year degree? Do you have to know the law? No. In fact, you'll legally be covered. If you don't know the law, don't worry. The law's got your back on this one. You're not required to even know the law that you're supposedly enforcing. It doesn't even have to be a law. You can just think that it, it could be a law that you are enforcing, and legally your ass is covered. Again, what type of personality do you think this job is going to attract, right? It's a problem. It's a problem. The, the entire institution of policing, in America especially, but the entire institution of policing as a concept in modern metropolitan form at least, is a problem. Are you able to grandfather in your kids via recommendations for police school? Um, Karina, you know what? If your legacy, if your like dad was on the department, yeah, you're going to get in easier. Yeah. Okay, Lexi. Um, I'm totally not thinking about that one deputy who got caught with a 14-year-old girl twice without being fired. Uh, Supreme Court ruled they're allowed to lie to us, not to mention that it's difficult to tell who's actually a cop these days. Um... Japanese as well. Really? They don't have to know the law? What the fuck? Clearly the personality is going to be a violent one or prone to violence, but we're back to the dilemma. How do we keep police as a working institution bringing down the numbers of them randomly over... Oh, oh, that's easy. Japanese. That's, that's, that's easy. Um, that's, that's, no, no, that's, that's easy. Honestly, you can, you can fix this very quickly. Um, I can, I can introduce a, a market solution even for the capitalists, right? We could, we could go anarchist solutions on this one, which by the way, just get rid of them, right? But 
here's 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 the um, here's the solution. Minimum four year law degree, criminal justice degree, something. You you have to have a minimum of four years with a specific law focused, criminal justice focused degree, and you're required to carry individual paid liability insurance and any settlements either come out of the pension fund or they come out of your insurance directly. To hold a position as a police officer, you are required to be in good standing with your liability insurance. And if you are unable to obtain or maintain liability insurance, you are unable to have a job at the department. The insurance companies will sort that out real quick. You get one $10 million settlement on a cop's record and insurance companies are going to be like, yeah, you know what? No, we're not covering that cop. Your rates are now $10,000 a month. There you go. There's your market solution. Make them have a criminal justice degree. Make them have a law-focused degree, four to eight years minimum, and then make them carry individual liability insurance. Every nurse, every contractor, every doctor, everybody carries fucking individual liability insurance. There you go. There's your market solution. So, oh, you get booster shots for everything. Everything eventually wears off. Yeah, even like um, fucking chicken pox. Yeah, so that's okay. I'm okay with it. You know what? I'm at a point where these tetanus shots, every, every, all of them. I don't care. Like if these if these idiots like Bagheera don't want to understand scientific principles, that's okay, right? Like that's okay. Um, when Bagheera has a kid and the kid steps on a fucking nail and gets tetanus, and they don't want to like you know use the mystical arts of fucking in darken their soul with a tetanus vaccine, right? And their kid dies of some preventable illness. Whatever. I don't care. I've stopped giving a shit. I, I, I don't care. The only ones I care about are the ones that are like exposed to this stuff. The immunocompromised, the elderly, the, you know, the, the people, the, the infants, right? But the people who don't have a choice in this in society that are, that are near these morons when they, they conduct themselves in such stupid, just estupido ways, then I don't care. Like, like those are the ones I give a shit about. The, the willfully ignorant, you know what? guzzle some more radium water and call it. I don't care. I really don't give a shit anymore. Tippy. Why? There's a regular vaccine version for COVID. Not every vaccine for COVID is an mRNA vaccine. So why was your hesitancy from? Why don't you get the other uh, the other vaccine? Yeah, Astro, I mean, their efficacy is lower, but I mean, fuck, just take one. <clears throat> but hey, again, I don't care anymore. 
There's not a single part of my body that gives a shit. Um, also, fun fact, um, higher death rates, um, uh, pro-Trump counties now have higher COVID death rates. Yeah. No, it's not, and you're stupid for saying that. It's far from it, actually. So congratulations, you just played yourself. I, I COVID, um, literally, yeah. If you were, if you live in a pro-Trump uh, voting county, chances your uh, your chance of death from COVID is higher. Yeah. It's not the only one to need a booster? Wow, I'm shocked. Diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, and the polio vaccine also with an MMR booster? Whoa, it also, uh, uh, an MMR uh, vaccine also needs a booster? Oh my God, really? No, are you telling me Bagheera doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about? I am shocked. No, really, I am. Rev, here's your point, Redemption. Hey, Russell. Um, because chew toy, occasionally you want to punch down. Um, oh, wait, hang on. So this is on, this is on NPR. So it's probably not trustworthy. This is fake news, right? It's a fake, fake, fake news, fake news. Um, Oh, who would have guessed? Counties that went heavily for Donald Trump have seen lower vaccination rates and much higher death rates from COVID. Oh, I'm shocked. Shocked. Shocked, I say. Shocked. I am shocked. Oh, uh, however would I have guessed that this would be a thing? Um, I hate life. Okay, that just got stuck. Buddhist, I mean, I'm not really technically allowed to have an opinion on this, I don't think, but Moderna, right? Moderna seems to hit the, hits the, uh, it hits the mark, like the lowest mark for most of them. But that's, that's, there's an argument to be made whether that is about the fact that Moderna went for the highest possible dose, like sub threshold for a margin of side effects. And um, the other one went for the lowest effective dose. So there's discussion about that. Um, but yeah, um, Moderna tends to be the one that comes out ahead in statistics. So. Um. Oh, well, here, while we're at it. Uh, let's read a story. Okay. 
let's let's read a story. Um, this is from the nursing subreddit on Reddit. Um, I know the last thing any of us need is another ho- a COVID horror story, but this group has always been so supportive of venting that I just can't put on my friends and family anymore. He was healthy, active, and didn't even fucking smoke. A young, beautiful wife my age, two adorable kids, and a business he did with his dad. A whole family that was loving and involved. He wasn't vaccinated, and when he got COVID, he just tanked so hard and fast, we had to put him on ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. It's basically external oxygenation of your blood. When he'd cough through the paralytic, it would take him three days to recover his O2. He had a massive clot in his heart that kept breaking down and reforming, clogging the ECMO and causing a panic multiple times a day. I played his Pandora playlist for him and jammed out to his rock and metal songs. I trimmed his mustache and his beard so it wouldn't get tickled on the ventilator. Early on when trialing him off paralytics was an option, he'd begin to wake up, biting on the vent and opening his eyes. He would look scared, tears in his eyes. His panic would be so bad it would chatter out ECMO and tank his pressure. But I would cup his face with my hands and rub my thumb on his cheek and tell him he was safe. He was getting better every day and that I was right there with him. Whenever I did this, he would relax in my arms and let his eyes close. I've never had children, but I imagine the feeling is similar. I just wanted to protect him. I wanted, to beat, I wanted him to beat the statistics and the facts. I wanted him to be one of the miracle cases so bad that I fully, heartedly, and aggressively wanted to do everything possible. But if we can't save a healthy 30-year-old, then who was all this for? We had to switch him to VA ECMO to get him uh, ready to fly to another state for a lung transplant. The catheter punctured through his heart, and we went over an hour hypoxic till they fixed it. I watched them in tears, covered in blood, and debating desperately with angry eyes behind masks and shields. They decided to compassionately withdraw care. Within the hour, the wife and family was at his side, and I had to hear one more spouse screaming from behind the sliding doors. We let him die, and I helped undress, uh, undress the family while the nurse bagged and tagged. A family member asked the wife if she was going to get vaccinated now. And she said, no, I have faith. I just really wanted this one to live. We are going to have a generation of PTSD uh, nurses and doctors. Like, I don't think people realize how badly this is going to affect a generation of healthcare workers. This is going to create, like, complex traumas. Um, This isn't the kind of shit that, like, is your average. Like, look, you lose one a week, typically, um, as a nurse. You get pretty, you get pretty accustomed, but losing him at this rate in this manner, this is war. This is war. It's war. It's frontline work. This is going to create a generation of traumatized people. Here's another story. This is from my extended family. Mom, 50 plus, gets talked out of vax by daughter, 30 plus. Family gets COVID. Mom, after two weeks of ATI, care dies. This is about one month ago. Imagine how holidays will be for them, us, and how the daughter feels now. I hope she feels horrible. I hope she never I hope she never lives it down with the rest of the family, too. Um, I was an LPN. Hey, son. I was an LPN. I'd never go to work now. Yeah. I feel that. Um, Russell, how do you move on from that? You don't really, you really don't. It haunts you. I get sick of society coddling anti-vaxxers. We treat people who run with scissors and drunk drivers and people carrying bombs in a crowded mall with outright contempt and dismissal. We should be doing that for anti-vaxxers. Fucking plague rats. Um, 
By the way, no other diseases, no nothing. All good, non-smoker, normal. <laughs> My dad doesn't understand why I was so adamant I'm not becoming a nurse right now. It's near slave labor and they aren't taking care of our health providers. Uh, yeah, I know. Christianity is a death cult that requires participation of random people. Or Barrick. Um, yep, with her. Uh, my grandmother was a nurse. I'm glad she didn't live to see this shit. She passed several years ago. Uh, that girl's so 2020. Um, I, I just, I, I don't think, no. Um, first time I've gotten that, I think. Maybe? I don't know. Either way. No. Um... I just don't know what that, what that's going to look like. <laughs> Am I Tony Hawk? Yes. Um, yeah. I'm part of a secret government cloning program that involves Tony Hawk. Um, for sure. My God, my religion requires me to, requires me to try and kill any gods I may encounter. I respect it. Um, sorry, St. Peter, it's you or me, bro. I, I just, <sighs> Yes, Illuminati skateboarding program confirmed. Um, geez, Buddhist. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> uh, Sunrays. Uh, I'm reading the Bible for the first time. Lot had some messed up daughters. Um, oh, depression's already spiked. Yeah, yeah. Depression's already through the roof. Millennials and Gen Zers exhibit rates of general anxiety disorder and depression much greater than previous generations. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, and you're right. The kids, the kids are fucked. The kids are fucked. You're you're right. Like they're, they're normative experiences, dude. Just like um, Gen Zers, like sort of. I forget what age you'd be. Well, I can figure it out. I suppose. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Kai, you can do the math. Um. So like Gen Zers around the age of twenty ish, right? No, I'm um, sorry. Gen Zers around the age of. Oh, mm, how old are the Gen Zers? What's the top age on a Gen Z? This might be millennial Gen Z cusp. Either way, if you were like aware around 9-11, right? If you grew up with 9-11, 24. Okay, so low end, lo, uh, low end millennial, right? Like if you were like eight to 12, eight to 14, eight to 14, when 9-11 happened, shit fucked you up. Shit fucked you up, right? Like if you're in that same age category now, Right, like if you're if you're say uh, let's say five to f five to fourteen, right? Give it a nice nine year range, right? Um, that's good. It's gonna fuck you up. It's gonna fuck you up. Yeah, it's it's gonna it's gonna create some lasting patterns for sure. Some of which I actually I think we should have as a society: greater hygiene, cleanliness, fucking you know. Washing your fucking hands, covering your fucking mouth, not sneezing and coughing on everything, wearing masks when you're sick. There's a bunch of these changes we needed to make anyway, but, you know. <sighs> Jesus, Sunrise. Um, so. I'm fucked. The kids are fucked. The parents were fucked and their parents were really, really fucked and I'm fu and fucky and I'm getting a feeling this trend is repetitive. <laughs> Wither. History doesn't repeat, but as sure as hell rhymes. Just put it that way. Um, and speaking of fucky, Justin J. Waters for Congress. I don't know who this douchebag is. Um, I, I, I don't know who the fuck this douchebag is, right? Like, this is this is a thing, right? Um, the provision requiring women to register for the draft should also be removed. Women disproportionately are caregivers of children. If women are drafted, U.S. families will be destabilized like never seen. Men are meant to be expendable. Women are not. <laughs> all 
All right. All right. So, you know that, like, it's a, it's a classic feminist talking point, but it's a classic feminist talking point for a reason. Um, nah, that's not the reason. <laughs> it's, fuck it. Dude, this is just, this is patriarchy, right? Like, this is, you can be a victim of patriarchy and be a man, right? Like, this is a victim of patriarchy who's a man. Right. He's been he's been brainwashed like a motherfucker. He's looking at his fellow men and going, yeah, you're expendable. I, you need to die in war. Right. We must protect the women, the gentle snowflakes, the rearers and bearers of our children, the brood mares for the state. Right. And meanwhile, he's fucking at literally throwing the men into the tank treads. It's fucking ridiculous. He's a male victim of patriarchy. Um, yes, that is true. Uh, the dude's name was, uh, Justin J. Waters. Kind of, kind of got a little, little serial killer vibe to it. Justin J. Waters. Justin J. Waters. On tonight's true crime, Justin J. Waters, a renowned serial killer who used to pick up hitchhikers along I-15, he would dispose of the bodies out back of. I mean, come on, right? Like Justin J. Waters, it's it's got it's got a vibe, it's got a vibe. Um. It's the chuddiest name I've ever heard. <laughs> um. Oh, Jesus, Rev. <sighs> oh, um, this dude, um, uh, Hasharan, uh, either way, um, this dude on Twitter, he's a lawyer, he's great, um, just got rejected, he tweeted this out, um, fucking a couple months ago, and I just found it, <clears throat> just got rejected for an apartment as the landlord doesn't want a lawyer as a tenant. If that doesn't scream uh, the landlord's up to something fucky, right? Then I don't know what does, right? Fuck that. Like, oh yeah, we're rejecting you. Why? Based on your occupation. You don't want an attorney as a as as a um, as a tenant. Interesting. Interesting. I'm sure there's nothing sketchy going on there whatsoever. Just like red flag, red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> you say okay, but I'll be meeting with your other tenants to see if they need representation. Uh, <laughs> Aspen. I think I smell clients. <laughs> uh, fuck it. Uh, yep, yep. Never forget the father of capitalism um, spoke of landlords as parasites, right? Adam Smith, father of capitalism. Hey, Squiddy. I am. Uh... Yeah, exactly. Um, the father of capitalism hated landlords. Hated them. He hated the entire rentier class. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, and if you ever need any quotes, just hit me up. Fucking, I've got a, I got a list of fucking Smith quotes. Um. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, the rent of the land, therefore, considered as the price paid for the use of the land, is naturally a monopoly price. It is, uh, it is not at all proportioned to what the landlord may have laid out upon the improvement of the land or what he can afford to take, but as to what the far farmer can afford to give. Wealth of Nations, Chapter 11. Um, as soon as the land of any country has all become private property, the landlords, like all other men, love to reap what they never sowed and demand a rent even for its natural produce. Um, 
The landlord leaves the worker with the smallest share which the, with which the tenant can content himself without being a loser, and the landlord seldom means to leave him any more. Um, also Wealth of Nations. Uh, most of these are from Wealth of Nations. The landlord demands a rent even for unimproved land, and the supposed interest or profit upon the expense of improvement is generally in addition to this original rent. Those improvements, besides, are not always made by the stock of the landlord, but sometimes by that of the tenant. When the lease comes to be renewed, however, the landlord commonly demands the same augmentation of rent as if they had all been made by his own. Rent, considered as a price paid for the use of the land, is naturally the highest which the tenant can afford to pay in the actual circumstances. In adjusting the lease, the landlord endeavors to leave him no greater share of the produce than what is sufficient to keep up the stock. Keep in mind, he's speaking as an economist. Um, landlords are, the o uh, are only one of the three orders who revenue costs them neither labor nor care, but comes to them as it were of their own accord and independent of any plan or project of their own. That indolence, which is the natural effect of the ease and security of their situation, renders them too often not only ignorant, but incapable of that application of mind. I'm not kidding you. Adam Smith just called fucking <laughs> called landlords stupid. That's that's really highbrow talk. He just called fucking landlords stupid and lazy. That's if if you want here, if you want the quote, there's the quote in chat so you can copy and paste it. That's that's the father of capitalism calling landlords stupid and lazy. It's brilliant. Oh, we tab in amount again? All right, cool. <laughs> um, what's what's politically radical mean? Radical Oxford English Dictionary second definitional set fundamental or systemic change within uh, within a system, especially that of a political system. Look around. Do you think a couple of band aids are going to fix it? Do you do you, do you, do you think that like yeah, it kind of needs an overhaul, doesn't it? Congratu congratulations, you're already a radical. There you go. Um. Uh, okay, kelp was, this is a still Adam Smith, by the way. Kelp was never augmented by human industry. The landlord, however, whose estate is bounded by a kelp shore of this kind, will demand a rent for it, right? Like you literally, it's literally washed up on your fucking, your so-called land, right? And you're going to demand rent for it. It came from the ocean. You had nothing to do with it. You augmented it in no way. You injected no value via labor. It literally washed up on your shore and you're going to have the audacity to charge a rent for it, right? Like that's, you're going to charge for it. Mm, interesting. Even the father of capitalism is like, this is fucking dumb. He hated the rentier class, hated him. Um, every improvement in the circumstances of the society tends to raise the real rent of land. Ah, thank you, Karina. Oh. Jap, I want you to burn it all down and start over from scratch. The fact of the matter is, is that's just not an effective technique. All right, give me one sec. I need a door frame.
Reset the clock, Karina, please and thank you. Oh, all right. <laughs> I love you, Kavas. I really do. Oh. Um. All right. Now we'll tell the poop that they got in it to him. Uh, oh. Um. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. No. I. I. I use hyperbolic phrasing there. Um. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that. I really do believe that we need to complete overhaul. <laughs> I just advocate for a methodology that is um, not as in your face drastic as a lot of um, a lot of what you people who would call themselves radical would. It's it's a methodology I refer to as the Thesugian methodology. It's basically replacing pieces of society until the entirety of society has been replaced. Um, and it's it's named after the ship of Theseus from the Odyssey and the thought experiment of sh the ship of Theseus thought experiment. So like you know yeah, um, but right there, right fucking there, I'm telling you. Oh. Um, I, I somebody. Uh, somebody thought this uh, here at various places and times throughout history, individual mafioso Viking raiders or literal slave traders were the pillars of their communities. Right. Um, everyone who knew them individually would say they were good, righteous, moral individuals, but we know their profession to be unequivocally harmful to the people impacted by it. Choosing to be a landlord is the same. It doesn't matter how much of a saint your personal landlord is. Landlording as a profession is harmful by its very nature. Um, your code in high school was for uh, for weed was fucking Elmo. You know what our code in high school for smoking weed, uh, smoking weed was? Hey, let's go smoke some weed. Not kidding you. We had no subtlety whatsoever. Do you occupy and use that property at the same time as your rental of it? Or is that extraneous? Uh, are you just owning a property and renting it? Because if you're just owning and renting a property, what, it, what the critique would be is that you have privatized an element of the commons that is required as a necessity for life and your uh, commercialization and commodification of that property is uh, directly harmful to society and has a leeching-like effect upon the economy. The moral and ethical critiques are from various leftist positions. The economic critique is, again, directly from the father of capitalism himself, Adam Smith. Right? Like, this is Smithian economics. Landlords are parasites from an economic standpoint. They don't actively. What what's the thing? Um, what's what's the thing? Uh, oh, Caboose just posted it recently too. Um, landlords provide housing the same way scalpers provide concert tickets. You don't actually provide housing. All you're doing is deriving revenue from something else somebody already uh, somebody else already provided. You are a net negative to society as a landlord. So, yeah, it's a thing. Oh, you guys want to see like a classic? Um... <laughs> you guys want, you want irony? You want irony, right? Like here's, here's, here's fucking irony. Um, Mike Tyson Social media made y'all way too comfortable With disrespecting people And not getting punched in the face for it Who fucking tweets this out 
I, I'm sorry. Who posts? Uh, who posts this? Some fucking louder with Crowder fan on the loud uh, on the uh, the Steven Crowder fan on the louder with Crowder subreddit, right? Some fucking Steven Crowder fan posts this to their goddamn subreddit with so true that he's talking about y'all. <laughs> he's talking about y'all. <laughs> fucking a. These motherfuckers don't even have a semblance of self uh, of self awareness. <laughs> you thought your mouth. I fuck you till you love me. Um. Yeah, good on you, son. Good on you, sunrays. Uh, self-awareness is for libs. <laughs> hey, hey, Corey. Um, oh. Uh, oh. Um, so <laughs> Rev still bitter about it. Um, Republican Congress person from California, um, Devin Nunez, um, is resigning from Congress to become the CEO of Donald Trump's new social media company. No, I didn't just have a stroke. You know, Devin Nunez, the guy who sued a fake cow on Twitter multiple times. That Devin Nunez. He's, yeah. So, you know, that's a thing that's happening. Uh... Distant. Never apologize. Not for anything like that, especially. Because the cow tried treating parlor and got banned. Um, <laughs> how many fingers I'm lifting up? Uh, oh. Okay. All right. 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 Hang on. All right. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> y'all are gonna love this. Y'all little fucker. Y'all are gonna love this. Uh Okay. <laughs> so we talked about these guys <coughs> over the weekend on uh on Discord. Patriot Front. They're a neo-Nazi white supremacist organization that split off from some other fucking group and blah blah blah. They were there at the like Unite the Right rally and shit like that, right? They're they're tiki torch motherfuckers type. Right. Straight up. Um, Jews will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. These, these idiots. Right. So they, um, they became aware that one of the potential members on their communication server was an infiltrator. Yeah, the ones who can't march. That is true. That is correct, Sunrays. Yeah, the ones who can't march correctly. Them. Um, so, they found out that one of the people on the server was a quote-unquote infiltrator, right? And they had a conference call to discuss what to do. What they didn't do was lock down the server first. So somebody from a leftist organization um, decided to join them for the call. Um, <laughs> uh, 
You know, I think I'm done talking. I'm just going to play some music. Stamattina mi sono alzato. Oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Stamattina mi sono alzato. Everyone log off right now. Everyone log off right now. This is Network Director Samuel Virginia. Log off right now. Everyone. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so um, for those of you that asked, um, that that's a protest song from Italy in the 19th century from like Italian workers in the like northern fields, I think is where um, either way um, it was adopted. It was created during the worker protest in northern Italy in Modena, I think. Um, mo- uh, but it was adopted by anti-fascists um, I- by the Italian partisans um, for the Italian resistance against Nazis. Um, so, of course, Bagheera is like, oh, this song is terrible. Fuck this song, that sort of thing. Because that song is anti-Nazi. That's literally what that song is about. It's about a, a, opposing fascism and Nazism. That's what that song is about. So, like, just, you know. Of course, Bagheer is like, fucking, ah. That song's literally an anti-fascist anthem. Um, and it's also a catchy song. Yes. Um, all you have to do is search for Bella Chow on fucking YouTube and you will find it. it it's, it, there's plenty of iterations. Everybody has fucking done a remix or a version of Bella Chow. It, it's yeah. <laughs> B-E-L-L-A-C-I-A-O. If you want the, if you're not, if you're like, how the fuck do I spell chow, by the way? Um, I prefer, dude, yeah, uh, Che, I'm in that camp as well, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I adore, I, it was great. It was great. Fucking, everyone log off! <laughs> yes, somebody's been recording your conversations. <laughs> Americans can't spell French. Um... <laughs> oh, fucking doofy motherfuckers. Ugh. Easy. You spell French dressing and then remove the dressing. Fucking galaxy brain. Got some five head shit going on there. Fucking chew toy. Um. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, Zippy. I mean, there's versions of Bella Chow in just about every fucking tongue at this point, I'd imagine. Yeah, I'm seeing, like, Jamaican. I'm seeing Spanish. I'm seeing multiple Spanish covers. Yeah. You you can get Bella Chow in just about every language, I think. Bella Chow in 11 Asian languages. Japanese. Japanese. Bella Chow Japanese ska. Uh, usually, we just do the... Uh, we just do the Italian version, but there are there are English versions, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's English versions. Traditionally, though, in the English-speaking uh, realm, we use the Italian version. So. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was a highly privileged um, <coughs> comment, Jap. It's not as simple as looking for another country and just going, is it? That's that's a that's a very fairly classist statement, actually. Um. Breathe, Rev. Breathe. I know that's one of your fucking, like. Triggers, shall we say. <laughs> Breathe, Rev. You're 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 towing the line. Um, let's see. Uh, Red, is it against TOS to throw milkshakes? You know, probably. No one Twitch's boring fucking TOS rules. Um, probably so. Um, interesting Illinoisan um, new proposal. Um, <laughs> Illinois is proposing uh, uh, new regulations that if you're unvaccinated, you would have to pay for your COVID hospital bill. Straight up. Like, there's no coverage. Like, people could, insurance companies could deny you, the state could deny you, you fuck it. Like, you would be directly financially responsible if you refuse vaccination and you end up with COVID and you end up with a million dollar hospital bill. I don't know how I feel about it, but I am telling you about it. Sunrise, don't we have pills now for this? Um... Um, also, what was I going to fucking just say? Oh, Kellogg's, Kellogg's, everybody fucking figure out what the fuck Kellogg's, who Kellogg's is like owned by and owning, right? Figure out, you're going to have to, you're going to have to boycott Kellogg's. Bat manicure. I'm not surprised. Uh, I'm not surprised at all. Um, so Kellogg's is going to bring in scabs. Kellogg's has announced that they're going to lay off anybody striking and they're going to bring in like permanent temp workers. Um, yeah, the foreskin company with her. Yeah, the foreskin company. Um, so everybody figure out like what you got to do to get what get you got to get you got to go, what you got to get to go, fuck your fuck complete breakdown of the English language. Uh, figure out what you got to do to get around. But you, yeah, just... Um, don't, don't be buying Kellogg's products because now there's going to be some like scabs in your cornflakes. Buddhist, no more multigrain Kellogg's crackers for me. Yeah, don't just skip them. Just fucking skip them. They're 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 literally stating that they're gonna use like scab labor. They're just gonna go for it. Um, I don't know if you're gonna hear this. I don't know if you're gonna hear more about this, but this is a thing you should be aware of. Um.
Conservatives have a new boogeyman, critical energy theory. Okay, so those of you who don't know about the, uh, uh, about the fucking American Legislative uh, Executive Council, that's Alec here. Um, this morning at the Alec Community Meetings, Jason Isaac, director of the Koch-funded Texas Public Policy Foundation, wrote last Friday morning, you'll have the opportunity to push it back against the woke financial, uh, financial institutions that are colluding against American energy producers. The email obtained by the Center for Media and Democracy, first reported by CMD investigative journalist Alex Koch, offers a window into a rapidly congealing strategy among Republican state-level officials declaring war on, quote, critical energy theory within the financial sector. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Critical race theory, blah, 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 blah. Fucking claiming that CRT has infected the K-12 through curriculum, blah, blah, blah. Now Alex seems gearing up for a similar move on energy policy. The group's Energy, Environment, and Agricultural Task Force, which met on Friday, voted to back two pieces of model legislation that portray climate ch- call policy, even climate policy that doesn't exist yet, as unfairly discriminating against fossil fuel companies. The Resolution Opposing Securities and Exchange Commission and White House mandates on climate-related financial matters encourages states to take up legal challenges against forthcoming rules from federal financial in- regulators around climate risks and disclosures, potentially aiming to trigger a similar wave of lawsuits from states that follow the Clean Power Plan during the Obama administration. This follows a letter sent to the U.S. banking industry by state treasurers, plus a comptroller and auditor, and you can fuck right off with that shit. Fucking, um... This uh, uh, by straight treasury plus a comptroller and an auditor from 16 extraction heavy Republican controlled states just before Thanksgiving pledging collective action against reckless attacks on law abiding energy companies. The Dis- Energy Discrimination Elimination Act. I think you get the point. I think you get the fucking point. Um. Yeah. Yep, Wither. Um, oh, and wait. Oh, and Japanez, um, something to consider. For an American just to pick up and move and go somewhere else and work somewhere else, the U.S. claims worldwide jurisdiction on all income. So not only would a U.S. citizen who's broke already pay end up paying local state, federal, whatever taxes that you have in the national level. So Switzerland, Sweden, the UK, whatever. They'd also be paying um, federal income tax uh, and earnings taxes to the United States government as well while they're living abroad. So somebody who is broke and suffering in the US. Yeah, well, again, we're... Yeah. So we'll end up getting taxed three, four times, depending on how it's structured. Plus, you're talking about somebody who's already broke, dejected, potentially suffering from multiple healthcare illnesses. Remember, like somebody who's that up against it in the U.S. probably has some sort of mental and or physical issue to deal with as well. And paying for health care or gaining entry to another country for permanent residency or a work permit when you have multiple potential disabilities is also more difficult. Right? Like it it costs money for us to renounce our citizenship, Jap. Um Wilhelm, the reason CRT is bad in these people's eyes is because these people's parents and grandparents were the ones who fought against racial integration. And CRT teaches you that history. I'm not kidding. That's that's basically underpins most of it. Is like I don't want you to teach I don't want you to teach the history of race relations in this country. There's pictures of me fucking like you know, uh, there's pictures of me yelling at black people when we tried to integrate our schools, right? Like, th- that that shit's real. That generation still is walking around, right? People forget that, that this isn't some bygone era, 
right? The people that fought against racial integration are still alive, own shit, and are in major positions of power in this country. Teaching CRT teaches teaches the newest generation coming up. Yeah, you see Pop Pop, Pop over there? Yeah, he he was he's in this photo screaming at the Negroes that they need to get their own school. Yeah, the reason they don't want CRT taught is because, well, you know. Um, finding your roots is the most eye-opening ever show ever. Yep. Yeah, Wilhelm, it's it's fucked. Um. Yeah, that is true. The more poor you are, the more caged you are. <laughs> Fuck's <up. laughs> this fucking rap. Um, and and OpenGL, OpenGL saying the only way to manage to gain citizenship in the other country and also manage to terminate your U.S. citizenship and the U.S. does not appreciate when you do that, it actually costs money to to renounce your U.S. citizenship. That's a thing. It, there's there's an exit fee. You have to pay a certain amount of your assets value, and you have to pay to renounce your citizenship. It costs money to not be a U.S. citizen. Yeah. It's... Speaking of another billionaire went to space, are they coming back or are we just leaving them out there, Mike? Jap. Um, oh, we looked it up um, one day, Che. It's it's in the like two forty five range, something like that. It's in it's in that territory. It's like two hundred and fifty bucks. Um, Jap, this is this is the uh, um, here's here's the best way. All right. When you tell an American to just move out of like just oh, America sucks. Just move. Right. It's essentially the same as look, I'm not trying to be like race reductive or anything here, but it's in the same sort of camp of a school of thought as looking at a black person who's complaining about race relations and saying, well, just ignore it. It's it's one kind of ignorant, but two really bad taste given the factors involved. And so it's, you know, and I know you weren't aware of like the fact, like we are literally caught in this country to a huge extent. This is, this is a giant fucking multi-level. This is, it, our country's a giant pyramid scam and we're all caught in it. That's, that's boils, what it boils down to. Yeah. I, you know, um, I get a, like, um, yeah, well, we, we don't have that. We don't have that luxury. Um, Yeah, you can pay for expediting uh, Aspen. It costs like $150 more or something like that. Uh. Oh, jeez, Rev. The IKEA is bad for taking your passport for smoking a joint. Jesus Christ. Um... Where is, um, I have something. Oh, wrong page. That's why. <laughs> Here you go. Um. Oh, for fuck's sake. There you go. Uh, Al uh Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. All right. Yeah, distant red. Yeah, just move is like telling somebody with chronic anxiety. Just don't worry about it. Um, Emma and Alexander, right? 
We pointed out that the chief sufferers of every war were the workers, and that they were being used as mere pawns in the game of international diplomacy and imperialist capitalism. The practice of stifling and choking free speech and press, established and tolerated during the war, sets the most dangerous precedent for after-war days. The principle of such outrages upon liberty once introduced, it will require a long and arduous struggle uh, to win back the liberties lost. Why is this important? Because these two were deported from the U.S. for expressing these opinions. Okay. Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman. Also, you have to remember, um, Jap, um, you're not allowed to travel if you have a felony. Keep in mind, the U.S. The US uses its so-called criminal justice system as a method of capture and detain for poor people. Remember, we have the highest prison population on the planet per capita or, uh, or just uh, net or gross, net or gross, right? We have the highest prison population on the planet and we use it to punish people of color, minorities, poor people, right? Like we, we have actual slavery, right? As codified in our 14th Amendment. And we know f police love rounding up poor people and people of color. Right? Like, this is a known problem in the U.S. If they slap you with the right criminal charge, you're not allowed to leave the country. It's then illegal for you to, le uh, for you to leave the country. Okay? 1% of our population at any given time is in prison. Or vote, or own a firearm, or all a host of other things. But for the purposes of this conversation, like, we're talking about travel, right? They can't travel. They're not allowed to leave the country. And frankly, usually the country they're trying to go to won't have them because they're an undesirable element. It, it's, it's such a more complex issue than just move. I hope I said 13th. I I feel like I said 14th. It's the 13th Amendment. Just just, just so you know. Like, I, I feel like I I know it's the 13th. I, I just covered it the other day. Um, yeah. Except as punishment for crime. Yep. It's a number. We have tiered citizenship. <clears throat> I can, you, anybody can. You can, you can buy citizenship here and abroad. Here it just costs more. Um, but like, go down to Dominica. Dominica, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. They'll give you, uh, they'll give you citizenship straight up. You can just buy citizenship. So, like, if you need out of the country, and you have a quarter of a million dollars of disposable income then by all means, you can just buy yourself a citizenship from another country. But if you're fucking Malta's 210 euros, yeah. See, if you're rich, have you removed, renewed your citizen prime membership? Um, if you're rich, it's not an issue. This is, this, this is the thing. Like this is, it's highly classist to say just move, especially to an American. You need to you need to spill um, American government secrets, and the Russians may take you into their embassy. Yeah, no, I I I hope fucking Americans, no Europeans, use commas and decimals differently. Um, yeah, and if you do not, as we pointed out. If you don't renounce your U.S. citizenship, which, by the way, comes with all sorts of additional problems, but if you don't renounce your U.S. citizenship, then you pay you pay uh, you pay uh, you pay you pay taxes in America, no matter where you are. The, as I stated before, the U.S. claims global, worldwide jurisdiction on U.S. citizens. There is no other place on this planet that the U.S. does not stake a claim on its citizens. There's no other country, by the way, that operates this way.
The U.S. has agreements with financial institu- uh, institutions, ministries, banking groups, governments, parliaments, the globe over to report our uh, uh, any potential expat earnings back to the U.S. so we can keep track of it. So, it's expensive for us to leave. It's impossible for some of us to leave. It's expensive us for us to go be wherever we end up going. And given the mental and physical effects of living in America for long ter- periods of time, most of the places that you would tell us to go to won't want us. could probably hide out in some Afghan caves though or you know or a compound in Pakistan for a few years Uh. so yeah. Yeah, and as Rev points out, Rev would literally go live in the woods, but it's it's illegal. It's illegal. Oh, miss me with the conspiracy thing. Just, I don't, just miss me with it. (laughs) But. Uh, So instead of saying just leave, the new dumb advice should be just be a millionaire. Hanashiao? Hanashiao? Um, spot on, spot on. Uh, did I see the follow screenshot you posted in shared content earlier? Ah, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, just, just. Just, have y'all tried not being poor? Yeah, there, Mike. Yeah, just don't be poor. Like, have y'all tried just, like, being born to rich parents? You should try that. Yeah. Like, that That definitely is it's definitely the way to go. Yeah, no, but really. Hmm. Fucking, hmm. I'm going to try that. I tried doing nothing, and then I'm all out of ideas. Uh, Semen lotto. Yeah, it's 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 bullshit. It's bullshit. <laughs> Judge, just don't be poor. Why didn't I think of that? Oh, I'm so dumb. Um, how much effect do you think being poor has on your health? Oh, no, no, we've, we've, we've studied that with her. Poor people die younger. They die of preventable illnesses. Being poor shortens your lifespan and lowers your quality of life. Yeah. hundred percent. So... Oh, fuck off. Hard times make hard men. Easy times make weak men. I I hope you don't actually mean that. I hope you're just parodying, like parodying those idiots that actually say that. (laughs) I decided to be rich and now I listen to Fortunate Son to be ironic.
Yes, Marcus, the, with the women who own horses. Yeah, implication, horses are good for you. Uh, women who own horses live longer. Implication, horses are good for your health. Reality, if you can afford to own a horse, you can afford good health care. It's fucking... Oh, and speaking of horrible, horrible people that I can't, like, speak directly about, the Sackler family. The Sackler family, who made an estimated $24 billion from selling Oxycontin for 10 years, 2010 to uh, 2020, approximately, um, granted sweeping immunity since they paid $4.5 billion out. So they made $19.5 billion off of creating an opioid crisis in our country. How, like nearly incalculable amounts of deaths directly at their uh, at their feet and they made 19.5 billion dollars from it mm. oh god did you literally just say soy po soy politics lol weak Oh, sweetheart, Pookie. I'd love to see you get on the air with me and actually have a conversation. They do, uh, Red. They do. I mean, I don't, I don't consume soy. Does this person take brain pills? <laughs> Yeah, I don't consume soy. Go for it if you want. I mean, most people do. Soy sauce, right? I use coconut aminos, but... <clears throat> yeah. Is that about how much land is locked up producing soy as feed for cattle? Or the fact that um, <clears throat> the Trump administration caused soy farmers to lose how much money? and cause us to bail them out to the tune of how much money because he implemented tariffs on a country not understanding how tariffs work. Yeah, that's that was one of my favorites was when the soy crops started fucking rotting in the fields because of the Chinese uh, the tariffs on Chinese uh, uh, consumption, right? Like that was that was brilliant. It was a masterstroke. And then the Chi uh, the Chinese markets shifted to other producers such as Brazil that, and they have no intention of switching back, by the way, and that cause even more in ecological uh, damage. The Brazilian soy producers are notorious for just murdering indigenous tribes and cutting down, you know, huge swaths of the Amazon jungle. Oh, it's great. It's great. It's great. It was fucking brilliant. It's, it's almost like, it's almost like having a, like a, a baseline high school level understanding of economics and maybe, I don't know, diplomacy. Um, here's an idea. Don't be a fucking uh, pathological narcissist. And that's probably a starting position, but you know, have, have a basic understanding of just high school economics and you wouldn't make mistakes like that. But you know, that's just, that's just me who actually kind of, you know, just, just mildly functionally understands what a tariff is and how it affects the economic processes. But, you know. Oh, Mike, I mean, don't get me wrong. F f fuck Biden, right? Fuck Biden. Fuck Trump. Fuck, fuck Obama. Fuck, fuck every last one of these. Right? Like, that's, that's you know, I'm an anarchist for fuck's sake. Right? Like, I, I, get, I get a third position. <laughs> Viva, I know. Whoa, high school diplomacy. Isn't that too much credit? Like... I, I wish we need to have a store as a community where we sell all of this chud merchandise oh did everybody see that fucking um, Alex Jones buys his coffee from the Zapatistas everybody saw that right Alex Jones buys his coffee from the Zapatistas that's uh, confirmed by Alex Jones on air. Yes. Yes. 
on his fucking air. He he owned up to it and confirmed it. Yes, Alex Jones buys his coffee from the Zapatistas. Yep. It's brilliant. Yep, Alex Jones economically supports the Zapatista movement. Mm -hmm. They are. They are. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Jones here from Proudly Radical. Since I owe Kai a few favors from back in the old days. Uh, shit, I probably shouldn't talk about that. Wait, why are you still recording? Fine, fine. Just be sure to edit it out. Anyways, as I was saying, this is Alex Jones, and I just wanted to teach the proletariat a few things about anarchism. Anarchism isn't about chaos. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Anarchism is about the people. It's about solidarity and mutual aid. It's about removing unjust authority and hierarchies. We should all be anarchists. The world would be a better place. Now, I'm going to apologize again to all those parents whose lives I ruined because I'm such a douchebag. Jones, out. All right, guy, this has got to make us even for that uh, incident you helped me out with. Alex Jones, everybody. Close friend of the channel. Close friend of the channel. Oh, no. Alex. See, see, you have to understand, Alex Jones is a performance piece. In order to... Des he, he, he is, he is a, an avant-garde artist who is willing to self-sacrifice his, his, his well-being, his time, his fortune in order to spurn change in society. See, Alex Jones saw how poorly our society was handling things like school shootings and how there was a contingent of conspiracy theorists out there that were saying th horrible things like, you know, that these these children that were being just murdered in their schools were crisis actors and these sorts of things. So he took it upon himself to become a martyr for the cause. He espoused this rhetoric knowing full well that he would become le legally culpable for such behaviors. He put forth horrible Chinese knockoff whole wholesale bullshit products and sold them as brain energy uh, compounds to try and get the FDA to actually do something, uh, uh, you know, to actually shut down some of these fucking con artists and scam artists. Alex Jones is like a 11th dimensional activist. You just don't understand. He's willing to self-sacrifice for the good of all of us. He's like Jesus. Alex Jones is like a modern day Jesus. Yeah. Uh, and hey there, Carpe. Alex Jones is Bill Hicks's bed work. I that one I, that one always bothers me a little bit, just because fucking I adore Bill Hicks on such a level that it's like, oh god, I don't want to sully Bill, uh, you know, Hicks's legacy with being associated with Nut Job McGee. But yeah, um, yeah, Alex Alex Jones is 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 a champion of the people and an advocate for change in a way and in a manner that you, you never saw coming. <laughs> He's just a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. <laughs> Have you prayed to your Jones tribute today? Sacrifice your gay frogs? Um, fucking Alex Jones, I swear to God. Ah. Uh, Um, look, I, I, look, I just, this is just general state of shit of the world, right? Like file this under, like miss me with, I know some of you are going to be like, you know, fucking 
first world developed nation fucking causes X, Y, and Z. Like, trust me, I, I feel you. But just for a moment, just be like, okay, this is just the state of the world and how shit it is, right? Here's a video. Um, this is Tingo Maria. Um, it's in Peru. Um, the, the garbage is literally being directly dumped into the Amazon river, uh, adjacent to Tingo Maria. Um, and the person who took this video is a gentleman by the name of Martin Hutchison. Um, and the, he released this video on social media. And if you want to know how bad it is, you can tell by the response um, Martin was literally threatened by the Peruvian government. <laughs> it's funny. I get it. I get it. Martin was literally threatened by the Peruvian government and he was forced to flee the country because he started documenting these sorts of events. That it isn't just like, oh, locals, you saw there's an actual like backup area there. Like it's, it's formalized. They're literally like just dumping the garbage into the Amazon River. So, yeah. Yay. We're fucked. Uh, do they have a beef with the people down river? Um, all right. Uh, oh, great. Apparently microplastics cross the blood brain barrier. So that's totally fine. They do. They do. It's like a landfill, but without the hole in the ground. Um, so yeah. I wonder if they take wholesale coffee beans for coffee shop businesses because I was considering sorry to, I, dude Nova if a, if Alex Jones can get the, get his hands on fucking Zapatista coffee for his coffee company I bet you can yeah Oof, Jesus Christ okay one fucking don't use Google Chile legalized same-sex marriage, though. I mean, it's something. Oy vey. Okay, so hold on. There's a couple of co-ops you would need to contact. Um, so here's here's one of them. And here's another one. Those are the names of two Zapatista cooperatives that are known to grow coffees. Uh, coffee. The first one is more than 680 families from five regions, and the second one is 380 families. And they're both Zapatista 
operated cooperatives. So there you go. In chat, if you if you want to look further, then go look for that. Apparently, they give tours. And apparently, you chill, you hold, uh, mm, Zohobal? Zohobal. Uh, Kuchulachan. Uh, Kulchan. Yeah. Uh, is it chill? Zohobal? Kulchan. Ugh, fuck. Sorry. New light in the sky. Uh, is what it actually translates out to. But yeah, they give they give tours. Like you can go down there and they'll show you around. Um Just to, does uh, does coffee actually um suppress testosterone, GL? I didn't know that. It's not my drug, so I don't really give a shit about it. Oh, microplastics. Oh, okay, yeah, that I didn't know. I was like, is that, is that a coffee thing? All right. Um, although microplastics are just generalized hormone disruptors, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they are. They're just generalized endocrine disruptors. So... Oh. oh, is Firefox fucking doing an update? Of course it's doing an update. All right. We need to get through this. We need to get through this. And you guys know what I'm talking about. We need to get through this. So... It, it's it's been I've been putting it off for a couple few like I honestly I put it off a fair amount last week um, I need to I need to even check I don't even know where we are we did 10 all right bear with me I have to move my shoulders Reset the clock, Karina. Please and thank you. Um, uh, we need to do this, though. All right. Let me look it up. Where are we? We're on 10. We need to do 10-1. All right. 10. There's 10-1. Oh, that's, these are long. That's why. Um, oh, Jesus Christ, 10-1 is so long. 10-2 is not short either. 10-3 is short. All right, fuck it. We just need to do this. I, I need to push through. Dude, I need to push through this. This is this is bullshit. We need to get this done. So we're doing more ANCAP fucking... I, I just want to be done with this series finally. Um, So give me a second. I got to fucking log in and fucking... 
do a bunch of shit here. Let me turn the alerts off and, and the bot. All right, follows are off. Subscriptions are off. Donations are always off. Hosts are off. Uh, that's off. That's off. All right. Uh, yeah, fucketh the Aneth's cap. Th 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 th. Um, I mean, I'm okay with fetishizing the concept of sissification, but can we not use it as like a technical term? <laughs> it feels, that feels, that feels weird. Um, all right. Uh, yes, Zuby. You'd be surprised the many forms of ANCAP that the bot can recognize. Um, the bot can parse it. So. Is sissification what the government does to frogs? 100%. Yep. <clears throat> Goddamn frogs. All right. I'm going to try... I'm going to lose a bunch of you. We're about, we're about to, we're about to drop a bunch of fucking viewers. <laughs> we're about to drop a bunch of fucking viewers. Um, can the frogs gray <laughs> Russell? Uh, it's not like that. Russell, whenever I do a theory, read things pretty quickly. Um, but I, I feel it's important to have this series in the bag and I've been putting it off and like I still, we still have so many sections. I mean, 11 can be banged out. You know what? Ele chapter 11 can be banged out in a fucking week. No problem. But 10 I've been putting off. <laughs> Hana, I'm for it. I'm for it. Oh, all right. Uh. Ten, ten, one is long. It's long. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm already Russell. I'm already. Um. <laughs> I'm so over fucking dunking on ANCAPs. They're they're so dumb. They're so dumb. Anyway, all right. Of course, my throat gets a little fucking scratchy right as I start this. Ugh, even my body's like, don't do it. Yeah, I just, just did red, but you know what? I'll fucking... All right, here we go. Chapter 10, Section 1. Would privatizing banking make capitalism more stable? Jesus, no. It's claimed that the existence of the state or for minimal statist government policy is the cause of the business cycle, reoccurring economic booms and slumps. This is because the government either sets interest rate too low or expands the money supply, usually by easing credit restrictions and lending rates, sometimes by just printing fiat money. This artificially increases investment as capitalists take advantage of the artificially low interest rates. The real balance between savings and investment is broken, leading to overinvestment, a drop in the rate of profit, and so a slump, which is quite socialist in a way, as many socialists also see overinvestment as a key to understanding the business cycle, although they obviously attribute the slump to different causes, namely the nature of capitalist production, not that the credit system doesn't play a part in it. In the words of Austrian economist uh, W. Duncan Rieke, the business cycle is generated by monetary expansion and contraction. When new money is printed, it appears as if the supply of savings has increased. Interest rates fall and businessmen are misled into borrowing additional funds to finance extra investment activity. 
this would be of no consequence if it had been the outcome of genuine saving, but the change was government-induced. The new money reaches factory, uh, factory owners in the form of wages, rent, and interest. The factory owners then spend the higher money incomes in their existing consumption investment proportions. Capital good industries will find their expansion has been an error and malinvestments have been incurred. Markets, Entrepreneurs, and Liberty, pages 68 to 69. In other words, there has been wasteful misinvestment due to government interference with the market. Again, Markets, Entrepreneurs, and Liberty, page 69. In response to this negative influence in the workings of the market, it's suggested by right libertarians that a system of private banks should be used and that interest rates are set by them via market forces. Mm, market forces. In this way, an interest rate that matches the demand and supply for savings will be reached and the business cycle will be no more. But by truly privatizing the credit market, it's hoped by the business cycle will finally stop. Unsurprisingly, this particular argument has its weak points and in this, in this section, we'll try and show exactly why this theory is, well, wrong. Let's start with Riki's starting point. He states that the main problem of the slump is why is there suddenly a cluster of business errors? Businessmen and entrepreneurs are market experts. Otherwise, they would not survive. And why should they all make mistakes simultaneously? It is this cluster of mistakes that the Austrians take as evidence that the business cycle comes from outside the workings of the market, i.e. exogenous in nature. Reiki argues that an error cluster only occurs when all entrepreneurs have received the wrong signals on potential profitability and all have received the signals simultaneously through government interference with the money supply. Mm. But is this really the case? A simple fact is that the groups of rational individuals can act in the same way based on the same information and this can lead to a collective problem. For example, we do, not, uh, we do not consider it irrational that everyone in a building leaves it when the fire alarm goes off and that the flow of people can cause holdups at the exits. Neither do we think it's unusual that traffic jams occur after all those involved are all trying to get to work, i.e. they're reacting to the same desire. Now, it is so strange to think that capitalists who all see the same opportunity for profit in a specific market decide to invest in it or or that the aggregate outcome of these individually, individually rational decisions may be irrational, I cause a glut in the market. In other words, a cluster of business failures may come about because of a group of capitalists acting in isolation over-invest in a given market. They react to the same information, namely super profits in market X. They arrange loans, invest, and produce commodities to meet demand in the market. However, the aggregate result of these individually rational actions is that the aggregate supply far outstrips demand, causing a slump in the market and perhaps business failures. The slump in this market and the potential failure of some firms has an impact on the companies that supplied them. The companies that are dependent on their employees' wages and demands, the banks that supplied the credit, and so forth. The cumulative impact of this slump or failures on the chain of financial commitments of which they are built, but one link can be large and perhaps push an economy into general depression. Thus, the claim that something external to the system that causes depression is, well, as typical, flawed. It could be claimed that the interest rate is the problem. That it doesn't accurately reflect the demand for investment or relate it to the supply of savings, but it's not at all clear that the interest rate provides the necessary information to the capitalists. They need investment information for their specific industry, but the interest rate is cross-industry. Thus, capitalists in market X do not know if the investment in market X is increasing, and so this lack of information can cause malinvestment or as overinvestment, and so overproduction can occur. As they also have no way of knowing what the investment decisions of their competitors are, or now these how these decisions will affect an already unknown future, capitalists may actually overinvest in certain markets, and the net effects of this aggregate mistake can expand throughout the whole economy and cause a general slump. In other words, a cluster of business failures can be accounted for by the workings of the market and not the existence of a government, in fact. <coughs> This is one possible reason for an internally generated business cycle, but that's not the only one. Another is the role of class struggle, which we'll discuss in the next section, and yet another is the endogenous nature of the money supply itself. This account of uh, money, proposed strongly by others, the post-Keynesian school, argues that the money supply is a function of the demand of credit, which itself is a function of the level of economic activity. 
In other words, the banking system creates as much money as people need, and any attempt to control that creation will cause economic problems and perhaps crises. Interestingly, though, this analysis has strong parallels with mutualist and individualist anarchist theories on the causes of capitalist exploitation and the business cycle itself. But money, in other words, emerges from within the system. And so the right libertarian attempt to blame the state, again, as as is tradition for right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists, is simply wrong. Thus, what is termed credit money, created by the banks, is an essential part of capitalism and would exist without a system of central banks, because this is because money is created from within the system. It's in response to the needs of capitalists. In a word, money is endogenous and credit money is an essential part of capitalism. Right libertarians do not agree. Rieke argues that, quote, once fractional reserve banking is introduced, however the supply of money substitutes with uh, will include fiduciary media, the ingenuity of bankers, other financial intermediaries, and the endorsement and guaranteeing of their activities by governments and central banks has ensured that the quantity of fiat money is immense. Previous citation, page 73. Therefore, what so-called anarcho-capitalists and other right libertarians seem to be actually complaining about when they argue that state action creates the business cycle by creating excess money is that the state allows bankers to meet the demand for credit by creating it. This makes sense for the first fallacy of this sort of claim is how could the state force bankers to expand credit by loaning more money than they have savings? This seems to be the normal case within capitalism. The central banks accommodate bankers' activities. They don't force them to do it. Alan Holmes, a senior vice president of the New York Federal Reserve, stated that, quote, In the real world, banks extend credit, creating deposits in the process, and look for the reserves later. The question then becomes one of whether and how the Federal Reserve will accommodate the demand for reserves. In the short run, the Federal Reserve has little or no choice about accommodating that demand. Over time, its influence can obviously be felt. Quoted by Doug Henwood, Wall Street, page 220. Although we must stress that central banks are not passive and do, and do have many tools for affecting the supply of money. For example, central banks can operate, quote, tight money policies, which have significant impact on an economy and via creating high enough interest rates, the demand for money. It could be argued that because central banks exist, the state creates an environment which bankers take advantage of. By not being subject to free market pressures, bankers could be tempted to make more loans than they would otherwise in a pure capitalist system, i.e. create uh, create credit money. The question arises, though, would pure capitalism generate sufficient market controls to stop banks loaning in excess of available savings, i.e. eliminate the creation of credit money or fiduciary media? It's It's to this question that we're going to turn now. As noted above, the credit for uh, the demand for credit is generated from within the system, and the comments by Holmes reinforced this. Capitalists seek credit in order to make money, and banks create it precisely because they are also seeking profit. What right libertarians actually object to uh, is the government, via the central bank, accommodating this creation of credit. If only the banks could be forced to maintain a savings to loan ratio of one, then the business cycle would stop. But is this likely? Could market forces ensure that bankers pursue such a policy? Uh, <laughs> we, think, we think not, simply because the banks are profit-making institutions. As post-Keynesianist uh, Hyman Minsky argues, because bankers live in the same expectational climate as businessmen, profit-seeking bankers will find ways of accommodating their customers. Banks and bankers are not passive managers of money to lend or to invest. They are in business to maximize profits. Quoted by L. Randall Ray, Money and Credit in Capitalist Economies, page 85. This is recognized by Ricci in passing, at least. He notes that fiduciary media could still exist if bankers offered them and clients accepted them. Bankers will tend to try and accommodate their customers and earn as much money as possible. Thus, Charles P. Kindleberger comments that monetary expansion is systematic and endogenous rather than random and exogenous. seems to fit far better than the reality of capitalism that the Austrian and right libertarian viewpoint, uh, uh, Mania's Panics and Crashes, page 59, and post-Keynesian L. Randall Ray argues that, quote, the money supply is more obviously endogenous in the monetary systems which predate the development of a central bank. In other words, the money supply cannot be directly controlled by the central bank. 
since it is determined by private decisions to enter into debt commitments to finance spending. Given that money is generated from within the system, can market forces ensure that non-expansion of credit, i.e. the demand for loans, equals the supply of savings? To begin to, answer, uh, to begin to answer this question, we must note that investment is, quote, essentially determined by expected profitability. Philip Arrestis, uh, uh, yeah, Arrestis, the post-Keynesian approach to economics, page 103. So uh, investment is essentially determined by expected profitability. This means that the actions of the banks cannot be taken in isolation from the rest of the economy. Money, credit, and banks are essential parts of the capitalist system, and they can't be artificially isolated from expectations, pressures, and influences of that system. Let's assume that the banks desire to maintain a loan, uh, loans-to-savings ratio of one and to try to adjust, adjust their interest rates accordingly. Firstly, ch uh, firstly, changes in the rate of interest, quote, produce only a very small, if any, movement in business investment according to at least empirical evidence, and that the demand for credit is extremely inelastic with respect to interest rates. Thus, to keep the supply of savings in line with the demand for loans, interest rates would have to increase greatly. Indeed, trying to control the money supply via, by controlling the monetary base in this way will only lead to large fluctuations in interest rates. And increasing interest rates has a couple of paradoxical effects. Now, According to economist Joseph Stiglitz and Andrew Weiss in Credit Rationing in Markets and Imperfect Knowledge, American Economic Review, number 71, page 393 to 410, interest rates are subject to what is called the lemons problem, asymmetrical information between buyer and seller. Stiglitz and Weiss uh, applied the lemons problem to the credit market and argued and unknowingly repeated Adam Smith, you know, the father of capitalism, that a given uh, that at a given uh, given interest rate, lenders will earn lower return by lending to bad borrowers because of defaults than to good ones. If lenders try to increase interest rates to compensate for this risk, they chase away good borrowers who are unwilling to pay the higher rate, while perversely not chasing away incompetent criminal or malignantly optimistic borrowers. This means that an increase in interest rates may actually increase the profitability of crisis as more loans end up in the hands of defaulters. This gives banks a strong incentive to keep interest rates lower than what they otherwise could or should be. Moreover, quote, increases in interest rates make it more difficult for economic agents to meet their debt repayments, Philip, uh, Philip Arrestus again. Which means that when interest rates are raised, defaults will increase and place pressures on the banking system. At high enough short-term interest rates, firms find it hard to pay their interest bills, which cause or increase cash flow problems. And so, quote, sharp increases in short-term interest rates leads to a fall in the present value of gross profits after taxes, quasi-rents, that capitalist assets are expected to earn. Hyman Minsky, Post-Keynesian Economic Theory, page 45. In addition, to, in addition, production of most investment goods is undertaken on order and re uh, requires time for completion. As a rise in interest rates is not likely to cause firms to abandon projects in the process of production. This does not mean that investment is completely unresponsive to interest rates. A large increase in interest rates causes a present value reversal, forcing the marginal efficiency of capital to fall below the interest rate. In the long term, interest rate is also pushed above the marginal efficacy of capital, and the project may be abandoned. In other words, investments take time, and there's a lag between investment decisions and actual fixed capital investment. So if interest rates vary during this lag period, initially profitable investments become white elephants. As Mikhail Kalecki argued, the rate of interest must be lower than the rate of profit. Otherwise, investment becomes, well, pointless. The incentive for a firm to own and operate capital is dependent on the prospective rate of profit on that capital relative to the rate of interest at which the uh, firm can borrow. The higher the interest rate, the less promising investment becomes. If investment is unresponsive to all but very high interest rates, as indicated prior, then a privatized banking system will be under intense pressure to keep rates low enough to maintain a boom by perhaps creating credit above the amount available as savings. And if it does, overinvestment and crisis is the inevitable eventual outcome. If it does not do this and it increases interest rates, then consumption and investment will dry up as interest rates rise and the defaulters, honest or and, uh, and or dishonest, increase and a crisis will, well, eventually occur. 
This is because increasing interest rates may increase savings, but it also reduces consumption. Quote, high interest rates also deter both consumers and companies from spending so that the domestic economy is weakened and unemployment rises. Paul Omerod, The Death of Economics, page 70. This means that firms can tr- face a drop off in demand, causing them problems and perhaps leading to a lack of profits, debt repayment problems, and failure. An increase in interest rates also reduces demand for investment goods, which can also cause firm problems, increase unemployment, and so on. So an increase in interest rates, particularly a sharp one, could reduce consumption and investment, reduce aggregate demand, and have a ripple effect throughout the economy, which could cause a slump to occur. In other words, interest rates and the supply and demand of savings and loans, they're meant to reflect, uh, uh, and demand of savings loans, they're meant to reflect may not necessarily move an economy towards equilibrium, if such a concept is even useful. Indeed, the workings of a pure banking system without credit money may increase unemployment as demand falls in both investment and consumption in response to high interest rates, and then a general shortage of money due to lack of credit money resulting from the tight money regime implied by such a regime i.e. the business cycle would still exist. This was the case of the failed uh, uh, monetarist experiments in the early 1980s when central banks in America and Britain tried to pursue a tight money policy. The tight money policy did not, in fact, control the money supply. All it did was increase interest rates and lead to a serious financial crisis and a deep recession. As Ray noted, quote, the central bank uses tight money, money policies to raise interest rates. This recession must, uh, we must note, also broke the backbone of working class resistance and the unions in both countries due to the high levels of unemployment it generated, as intended. Such an outcome would not surprise anarchists, as this was a key feature of the individualist and mutualist anarchist arguments against the money monopoly associated with specie, uh, specie money. Um, They argued that the money monopoly created a tight money regime which reduced the demand for labor by restricting money and credit and so allowed the exploitation of labor, i.e. encouraged wage labor, and stopped the development of non-capitalist forms of production. Thus, Lysander Spooner's comments that workers need, quote, money capital to enable them to buy the raw materials upon which to bestow their labor, the implements and machinery with which to labor, unless they get this capital, they must all either work at a disadvantage or not work at all. A very large portion of them to save themselves from starvation have no alternative but to buy, uh, but to sell their labor to others. So letter to Grover Cleveland, page 39. It's interesting to note that workers did do well during the 1950s and 60s under a liberal money regime than they did under the tighter regimes of the 1980s and 90s. We should also note that an extended period of boom will encourage banks to make loans more freely. According to Minsky's financial instability model, uh, crisis, see the financial instability hypothesis, in post-Keynesian economic theory, for example, is essentially caused by risky financial practices during periods of financial tranquility. In other words, stability is destabilizing. In a period of boom, banks are happy and the increased profits from companies are, well, flowing into the coffers. Over time, banks note that they can use a reserve system to increase their income, and due to the general upswing, uh, upward swing of the economy, consider it safe to do so. And given that they're in competition with other banks, they may provide loans simply because they're afraid of losing customers to, well, more flexible competitors. This increases the instability within the system. As firms increase their debts due to the flexibility of banks and produces the possibility of crisis if interest rates are increased because the ability of businesses to fulfill their financial commitments embedded in debts deteriorates. Even if we assume that interest rates do work as predicted in theory, it's false to maintain that there's one interest rate. This is not the case. Quote, concentration of capital leads to unequal access to investment funds, which obstructs further the possibility of smooth transitions in industrial activity. Because of their past record of profitability, large enterprises have higher credit ratings and easier access to credit facilities, and they're able to put up larger collateral for a loan. Michael A. Bernstein, The Great Depression, page 106. The larger the firm, the lower the interest rate they have to pay. Thus, banks routinely lower their interest rates to their best clients, even though the future is uncertain and past performance cannot and does not indicate future returns. Therefore, it seems a bit strange to maintain that the interest rate will bring savings and loans into line if there are different rates being offered. Of course, private banks 
cannot affect the underlying fundamentals that drive an economy, like productivity, working class power, and political stability, any more than central banks, although central banks can influence the speed and gentleness of an adjustment to a crisis. Indeed, given a period of full employment, a system of private banks may actually speed up the coming of a slump. As, we, as will be argued in the next section, full employment results in a profit squeeze as firms face a tight labor market, which drives up costs, and therefore increased workers' power at the point of production and in their power of exit. In a central bank system, capitalists can pass on these increasing costs to consumers and so maintain their profit margins for longer. This option is restricted in a private banking system, as banks would be less inclined to devalue their money. This means that firms will face a profit squeeze sooner rather than later, which will cause a slump as firms cannot make ends meet. As Riki notes, inflation, quote, can temporarily reduce employment by postponing the time when misdirected labor will be laid off. But as Austrians, like monetarists, think inflation is a monetary phenomenon, he does not understand the real cause of inflation and what they imply for a pure capitalist system. As Paul Ormerod points out, the claim that inflation is always and everywhere purely caused by increases in the money and supply, and that there are a rate of inflation bears a stable, predictable relationship to increases in the money supply is ridiculous. And he notes that increases in the flight of, uh, rate of inflation tend to be linked to falls of in unemployment and vice versa, which indicates its real causes, namely in the balance of class power and in the class struggle. Death of Economics, page 96 and page 131. Moreover, if we do take the Austrian theory of business cycle at face value, we're drawn to conclusion that in order to finance investment savings must be increased. But to maintain or increase the stock of loanable savings, inequality must be increased. This is because unsurprisingly, rich people save a larger proportion of their income than poor people, and the proportion of profits saved are higher than the proportion of wages. But Increasing inequality, as was argued in Chapter 3, Section 1, makes a mockery of right libertarian claims that their system is based on freedom or justice. This means that the preferred banking system of so-called anarcho-capitalists implies increasing, not decreasing, inequality within society. Moreover, most firms fund their investments with their own savings, which would make it hard for banks to loan these savings out as they, would, uh, as they could be withdrawn at any time. This could have serious implications for the economy, as banks refuse to fund new investments simply because of the uncertainty they face when accessing if their available funds, uh, if their available savings can be loaned to others. After all, they can hardly loan out the savings of a customer who's likely to demand them at any time. And by refusing to fund new investment, a boom could falter and turn to slump as firms don't find the necessary orders to keep going. So... Would market forces create sound banking? The answer is probably not. The pressures on banks to make profits come into conflict with the need to maintain their savings to loan ra uh, uh, ratio, and so the confidence of their customers. As Ray argues, as banks are profit-seeking firms, they find ways to increase their liabilities, which don't entail increases in rever reserve requirements. And if banks share the profit expectations of prospective borrowers, they can create credit to allow projects or investments to proceed. This can be seen from a historical record. As Kindleberger noted, the market will create new forms of money in periods of boom to get around the limit imposed on any money supply. Trade credit is one way, for example. Under the uh, monetarist experiments of 1980s, there, were deregulation, uh, there was deregulation and central bank constraints raised interest rates and created a moral hazard. Banks made increasingly risky loans to cover rising costs of issuing liabilities. Rising competition from non-banks and tight money, uh, money policy forced banks to lower standards and increase rates of growth in an attempt to grow their way to profitability. Thus, credit money, or fiduciary media, is an attempt to overcome the scarcity of money within capitalism. Particularly the scarcity of specie money, the pressures that banks face within actually existing capitalism would still be faced under pure capitalism. It's likely, as Ricky acknowledged, that credit money would still be created in response to the demands of business people, although not at the same level as currently the case, I imagine. The banks seeking profits themselves and in competition for customers would be caught between maintaining the value of their business, i.e. their money, and the needs to maximize profits. 
As a boom develops, banks would be tempted to introduce credit money to maintain as it's increasing the interest rate would be difficult and potentially dangerous for the reasons noted already. Thus, if credit money is not forthcoming, i.e. the banks stick to the Austrian claims that loans must equal savings, then the rise in interest rates required will generate an economic slump. If, it's, uh, if it is forthcoming, then the danger of overinvestment becomes increasingly likely. All in all, the business cycle is a part of capitalism and not caused by external factors like the existence of, say, a government. As Ricky notes to Austrians, ignorance of the future is endemic. But you would be forgiven for thinking that this is not the case when it comes to investment. An individual firm cannot know whether its investment project will generate the stream of returns necessary to meet the stream of payment commitments undertaken to finance a project. And neither can the banks who fund those projects. Even if a bank does not get tempted into providing credit money in excess of savings, it cannot predict whether banks will do the same or whether the projects it funds will be successful. Firms looking for credit may turn to more flexible, flexible competitors who practice reserve banking to some degree, and the inflexible bank may see its market share and profits decrease. After all, commercial banks typically establish relations with customers to reduce the uncertainty involved in making loans. Once a bank has entered into a relationship with a customer, it has strong incentives to meet the demands of that customer. There are examples of fully privatized banks. For example, in the United States, which was without a central bank uh, after 1837, the the major banks in New York were in a bind between their roles as profit seekers, which made them contributors to the instability of credit, and as possessors of uh, uh, country deposits against whose instability they had to guard. In Scotland, the banks were unregulated between 1772 and 1845, but the leading commercial banks accumulated the notes of lesser ones, as the Second Bank of the United States did contemporaneously in the U in United States, ready to convert them to specie if they thought they were getting out of line. They serve, that is, as an informal controller of said money supply. For the rest, as so often, historical evidence runs against strong theory, as demonstrated by the country banks in England from 74, uh, 1745 to 1835, wildcat banking in Michigan in the 1830s, and the latest experience with the banking deregulation in Latin America. Um, we should note that there are a few bank, uh, banking wars during the period of deregulation in Scotland, which forced a few of the smaller banks to fail as the bigger ones refused their money. And well, that was major banking failures in the air, uh, in the Iyer Bank. But Kendallberger argued that central banking arose to c control, uh, arose to impose control on the instability of credit and did not cause the instability which right libertarians maintain it does. But as will be noted in section uh, section three of this chapter, the the USA ruffered, uh, suffered massive economic instability during its period without central banking. Thus, if credit money is the cause of the business cycle, it is likely that a pure capitalism will still suffer it from it just as much as the actually existing capitalism, either due to higher interest rates or overinvestment. In general, the failed monetarist exper experiments of the 1980s prove well, trying to control the money supply is impossible. The demand for money is dependent on the needs of the economy and any attempt to control it will fail and well, cause a deep depression, usually via high interest rates. The business cycle, therefore, is an endogenous phenomenon caused by a normal functioning of the capitalist economic system. Austrian, and right ec uh, Austrian economists and right libertarians uh, claim that slump, fall, uh, slump flows boom, but for a totally unnecessary reason, government-inspired malinvestment. They're simply wrong. Overinvestment does occur, but it's not inspired by the government. It's inspired by the banks needing to make profits from loans and from businesses' need for investment funds, which the banks accommodate. In other words, by the nature of the capitalist system. All right. Uh, is there anything I need to pay attention to or can I just move? Fair enough, Zippy. I, fair enough. I don't think I'll, I, I don't know if I'll ever hit that, but fair enough. Duly noted. Oh God. How long is 10 to? It's not as long as 10 one though. Jesus. All right. <laughs> Crap.
Corey. No, the next one, Corey, Corey, the next one is Proudhon. It's, it's, it's not, it's not this thing though. It's, it's just this section. It's just this section. I just want to do what is property, but yeah. Ah, uh, thank you, Zippy. Uh, wait. Ugh. Wait, we got somebody doing sacred geometry. I see. I see. Fucking Rev saying. I think the troll is doing the Randall Carlson Carlson stuff. We got somebody doing sacred geometry. Like for real. That's adorable. Uh. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I don't think I'll be answering any of this person's questions, frankly. <laughs> uh, the truth project is a focus on the family thing, just so you know, right? Like when you when you see fucking the truth project, that's a focus on the family thing. Yeah. So. Uh, it probably is, Corey. It probably is. I mean, it's it's par for the course for me, right? Like, I mean, that's, you know, theory is, theory is thick. Theory is thick. It just is what it is. Yeah. I, I, you know what? Hang on, guys. Let me just, you know what? Let me just take this. Hey, uh, my, the truth project, what does any of that have to do with economic theory from the Austrian school of economics vis-a-vis -vis right libertarian interpretation of it into so-called anarcho-capitalist theory? Because that's what we're discussing. That's what I was reading from. That's the topic at hand. What does the Great Flood or the Sphinx of Egypt or your biblical bullshit have to do with any of that? Again, what the fuck does that have to do with any of that? You do realize that there's a history of economic policy. His, see, history is more than just your like sacred geometry, uh, sacred geometry conspiracy theory. So here's an idea. What do you have to say about Austrian economic theory vis-a-vis -vis right libertarian interpretation thereof? Because that's what we're talking about. And if you don't have an opinion on that, well, then maybe you don't, maybe this isn't the place for you. Oh, well, then feel free to leave because that's what we're talking about. Rather than your fucking Joe Rogan experience, fucking ancient aliens conspiracy theory bullshit.
Yeah. It's Sphinx, Sphinx age conspiracy shit. Like Carpe, it's a hundred percent. It's like who, I'm sorry. Fucking it, it's more subtle racism too, by the way, just more like just dog whistle shit. Right. Fucking, oh, those fucking people couldn't have done it. Shit. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would suggest that you just stop interacting. Like that's, yeah, no point. <sighs> smells like rain outside. It actually smells like rain. Oh, gosh, the guy who believes people can control objects with their minds and thinks pyramids were made by Atlantis? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, go look up Kukunut TV or something. Like K-O-K-O-N-U-T TV. He will, he will welcome your bullshit with open arms. Otherwise, fuck off. Ugh. Egyptians were dumb. They made their pyramids with four points and only a point in four directions. If only they made it perfectly round, it would point in all directions, says Viva. Oh, well, I mean, guys, 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 why are, why are you arguing with this fucking sheep? All right. This, this dude's asleep. All right, this dude is asleep. He is a sheep. I bet you he believes in trees. I bet you he fucking believes in trees, right? That's how that's how asleep this motherfucker is. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know. He believes in fucking trees. Watch. Mhm. Mm I bet the I bet he thinks forests are real. Yeah. Fucking Like come on. We, we all know the only true trees were the 300 kilometer high silicon trees. Right? Like, we all know that. We all know that. Just fucking, just dudes. <laughs> uh, anyway. There's at least one mod in chat if y'all get bored of him, let me know. Oh God, not the trees. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. That's why, just don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. Carpe's right. Carpe's spot on. Just don't give it to him. Right? Like that's, y'all are fucking giving this idiot what they want. Just ignore them. They're an idiot. Anyway, all right, I'm going to go back to what I was doing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, where's your resume? Let's see your resume. Put it up. You got your resume? Um, apparently the Fox News tree is fucking... This is the Fox News Christmas tree. Yeah, none of us know who you are, and there's a lot of fucking people who are terminally online here, so your reputation does not precede you. You're going to either have to post it, or we're just going to get rid of you at this point. War on at the war on Christmas. Your account is created November 22nd. Hey, everybody, the person who has an account that's less than like a couple weeks old definitely has a reputation and a resume that we should all be aware of. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> That's adorable. You're cute. Um, Corey, I don't trust any tree taller than me. All those bitches better be bonsai. Um, all right. Chapter, uh, chapter 10, section two, right? Oh God, it's going to be a bunch. Oh, distant red. Oh yeah. I've heard about Mayot. He's the guy who rolls around on his own feces and is awake way past his bedtime. Oh, see, I hadn't heard that. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Just made a repu himself a reputation of being a dumbass. Yeah. Fucking. Hey, good job. Good job. Anyway. Um. Oh. <sighs> yeah, I think it's time to close the door. I'll be right back. the fuck there we go oh. sidewalk i wish the arms were a little lower otherwise the back and the, the the seat like all of this is great i just wish the arms were a little lower just just to, just be able to lower them that much just like a another drop <clears throat> yeah that's my biggest complaint. So. Can we chat about our live live? I have no idea what the fuck you're asking, Viva. Uh. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but if I can get through section two, I can get through section three. Love lives. Oh, yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, go for it. I don't give a shit. Uh, just don't feed the trolls, right? Like, just don't feed the trolls. Uh, yeah, Viva's looking for Viva's looking for a new puppy since we put we sent his up to uh, fucking upstate uh, to the farm last time. All right, <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five, six, if five and a half pages on section two, so. My plans on Christmas? Jack shit. Jack shit. Nothing. I need to... Um, I need to do something, though. Oh, you know what? Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. I'm going to do that right now. Just give me a sec. Again. Still nothing. All right, I need to call them. All right.
Uh, all right. <clears throat> Here we go. Oh. Chapter 10, Section 2. How does the labor market affect capitalism? In many ways, the labor market is the one that affects capitalism the most. The right libertarian assumption, like that of mainstream economics, is that markets clear and therefore the labor market will also clear. As this assumption has rarely been proven to be true in actuality, i.e. periods of full employment within capitalism are well few and far between, this leaves its supporters with a problem. Reality contradicts the theory. The theory predicts full employment, but reality shows that this is not the case. Since we're dealing with logical deductions from assumptions, obviously the theory cannot be wrong, and so we must identify external factors which cause the business cycle and so unemployment. In this way, attention is diverted from the market and its workings. After all, it's assumed that the capitalist market works, and, well, on to something else then. This something else has been quite a few different things, most ridiculously sunspots, in the case of one of the founders of marginalist economics, William Stanley Jevons. However, these days, most pre-free market, uh, pro-free market capitalist economists and right libertarians have now decided that instead of sunspots being at fault, it's the state. In this section, I'm going to present a case that maintains that the assumption that markets clear is false for at least one reason, unique, market, namely the market for labor. As the fundamental assumption underlying free market capitalism is false, the logically consistent superstructure built upon comes crashing down. Part of the reason why capitalism is unstable is due to the commodification of labor, i.e. people, and the problems that this creates. The state itself can have positive and negative impacts on the economy, but removing it or its influence will not solve the business cycle. So why is this? Well, simply due to the nature of the labor market. Anarchists have long realized that the capitalist market is based upon inequalities and changes in power. Proudhon argued that the manufacturer says to the laborer, you are as free to go elsewhere with your services as I am to receive them. I offer you so much. The merchant says to the customer, take it or leave it. You're the master of your money as I am the goods. I want so much. Who will yield? The weaker. He, like all anarchists, saw that domination, oppression, and exploitation flow from inequalities of market economic power and that the power of invasion lies in superior strength. What is property? Page 220, uh, 216 and well, 215. This applies with greatest force to the labor market. While mainstream economics and right libertarian variations of it refuse to acknowledge that the capitalist market is based upon hierarchy and power, anarchists and socialists and communists and other leftists in general don't share this opinion because they don't share uh, because they do not share this understanding with anarchists right libertarians will never be able to understand capitalism or its dynamics and development thus when it comes to the labor market it's essential to remember that the balance of power within it is the key to understanding the business cycle thus the economy must be understood as a system of power so how does the labor market affect capitalism let us consider a growing economy, on that is, uh, one that's coming out of a recession. Such a growing economy stimulates demand for, un, uh, for employment as unemployment falls, the costs of finding workers increase, and the wage and condition and demands of existing workers intensify. As the economy is growing and labor is scarce, the threat associated with the hardship of unemployment is weakened. The share of profits is squeezed, and in reaction to this, companies begin to cut costs by reducing inventories, postponing investment plans, and, well, laying off workers. As a result, the economy moves into a downturn. Uh, unemployment rises, wage demands are moderated. All, eventually, this enables the share of profits, first of all, to stabilize and then rise. Such an interplay between profits and unemployment as the key determinant of the business cycle is observed in empirical data. Paul Omerad, The Death of Economics, page 188. 
Thus, an economy approaches full employment. Uh, thus, as an economy approaches full employment, the balance of power on the labor market changes. The sack is no longer that great a threat as people see that they can get a job elsewhere. Thus, wages and working conditions increase as companies try to get new and keep existing employees, and output is harder to maintain. In the words of economist William Lazenick, labor that is able to command a higher price than previously because of an appearance of a tighter labor market is, by definition, labor that is highly mobile via the market. And labor that's highly mobile via the market is labor whose supply of effort is difficult for managers to control in the production process. Hence, the advent of tight labor markets generally results in more rapidly rising average costs, as well as upward shifts in the average cost curve. Business Organization and the Myth of the Market Economy, page 106. In other words, under conditions of full employment, employers are in danger of losing the upper hand. Juliet B. Shore, the overworked American, page 75. Shore argues that employers have a structural advantage in the labor market. Because there are typically more candidates ready and willing to endure this work marathon of long, er of long hours than jobs for them to fill, page 71. Thus, the labor market is usually a buyer's market, and so the sellers have to compromise. In the end, workers adapt to this inequality of power, and instead of getting what they want, they get what they get. But under full employment, this changes. In such a situation, it's the bosses who have to start compromising, <clears throat> and they don't like it. As Shore notes, America has never experienced a sustained period of full employment. The closest we've gotten is in the late 1960s when the overall unemployment rate was under 4% for four years. But that experience does more to prove the point than any other example. The trauma caused to business by those years of a tight labor market was considerable. Since then, there has been a powerful consensus that the nation cannot withstand such a low rate of unemployment. So... In other words, employment is not good for the capitalist system. Do the power full employment provides workers. Thus, unemployment is a necessary requirement for a successful capitalist economy and not some kind of aberration in an otherwise healthy system. Thus, so-called anarcho-capitalists claim that pure capitalism will soon result in permanent full employment are, well, demonstrably false. Any moves towards full employment will result in a slump as capitalists see their profits squeezed from below by either collective class struggle or by individual mobility in the labor market. This was recognized by individualist anarchists like Benjamin Tucker, who argued that mutual banking would give an unheard of impetus to business and consequently create an unprecedented demand for labor, a demand which would always be in excess of the supply, directly contrary to the present condition of the labor market. The Anarchist Reader, page 149 to 150. In other words, full employment would end capitalist exploitation, drive non-labor income to zero, and ensure the worker the full value of their labor. In other words, end capitalism. Thus, for most, if not all, anarchists, the exploitation of labor is only possible when unemployment exists, and the supply of labor exceeds the demand for it. Any move towards unemployment will result in a profit squeeze and either the end of capitalism or an economic slump. Indeed, as I argued in the last section, the extended periods of approximately full employment until the 1960s had the advantage that any profit squeeze could, in the short run anyway, be passed on to working class people in the shape of, well, inflation. As prices rise, labor is made cheaper, profit margins supported, this option is restricted under a pure capitalism for, again, reasons discussed in the last section. And so pure capitalism will be affected by full, um, full employment faster than impure capitalism. As an economy approaches full employment, new, uh, hiring new workers suddenly becomes more, much more difficult. They're harder to find, cost more, or less experienced. Such shortages are extremely costly for a firm. This encourages a firm to pass on these rises to society in the form of price raises, so creating inflation. Workers, in turn, try to maintain their standard of living. Quote, every, uh, every general increase in labor costs in recent years, note Jay Breach, uh, Brecker and uh, Jay Costell in the late 1970s, has followed rather than preceded an increase in consumer prices. Wage increases have been the result of workers' efforts to catch up after their incomes have already been eroded by inflation, nor could it, be, uh, could it easily be otherwise. All a businessman has to do is raise a price, is to make an announcement. 
wage rates are primarily determined by contracts and so cannot be easily adjusted in the short term. Common sense for bad times, page 120. These full employment pressures will still exist with pure capitalism and due to the nature of the banking system will not have the safety value of uh, the safety valve of inflation. This means that periodic profit squeezes will occur due to the nature of a tight labor market and the increased power of workers this generates. This in turn means that a pure capitalism will be subject to periods of unemployment and so still have, again, a business cycle, a boom and a bust. This is usually acknowledged by right libertarians, at least in passing, although they seem to think that this is purely a short-term problem. It seems a strange short-term problem that continually occurs, but again, logic, empiricism, right-wing libertarians. But such an analysis is denied by right libertarians, usually. For them, government action combined with the habit of many labor unions to obtain higher, uh, higher than market wages rates for, the, uh, for their members creates an exacerbated mass unemployment. This flows from the deductive logic of much capitalist economics. The basic assumption of capitalism is, uh, capitalism is that market's clear. So if unemployment exists, then it can only be because of the price of labor wages is too high. Austrian uh, economist W. Duncan Rieke argues that unemployment will disappear provided real wages are not artificially high. Markets, Entrepreneurs, and Liberty, page 72. Thus, the assumption provokes the conclusion. Unemployment is caused by an unclearing market as markets always clear. And the cause for this is either the state or the unions. But what if the labor market cannot clear without seriously damaging the power and profits of capitalism? What if unemployment is required to maximize profits by weakening labor's bargaining position on the market and so maximizing capitalist power? In that case, unemployment is caused by capitalism, not by forces external to it. However, Let's, let us assume that the right libertarian theory is correct. It's not, but let's try it. Let's assume that unemployment is all the fault of the selfish unions and that a job seeker who does not want to wait will always get a job in the unhampered market economy. This is von Mises' quote, by the way, Human Action, page 595. Would crushing the unions reduce unemployment? Let us assume that unions have been crushed and the government has been abolished, or at least the very le at the very least become a minimum state. Think minarchist. The aim of the capitalist class is to maximize their profits, and to do this, they invest in labor-saving machinery and otherwise attempt to increase productivity. But increasing productivity means that prices of goods fall, and falling prices mean increasing real wages. It's it's high real wages that, according to real libertarians, that cause unemployment. So as a reward for increasing productivity, workers will have to have their money wages cut in order to stop unemployment from occurring. For this reason, some employers might refrain from cutting wages in order to, damage, uh, to avoid damage to morale, potentially an important concern, I suppose. Moreover, wage contracts involve time. A contract will usually agree a certain wage for a certain period. This builds in rigidity into the market. Wages cannot be adjusted as quickly as commodity prices. Of course, it could be argued that reducing the period of the contract and or allowing the wage to be adjusted could overcome this problem. However, if we reduce the period of the contract the workers are at at a suffer, um, uh, are at a suffering dis, uh, that, uh, that they are at a suffered uh, they suffer a disadvantage as they will not know if they have a job tomorrow and so they'll not be able to easily plan for their future, an evil situation for anyone to be in, see zero hour contracts in the UK. Moreover, even without formal contracts, wage renegotiation renegotiation can be expensive. After all, it takes time to bargain and time is money under capitalism. And wage cutting can involve the risk of loss of mutual good between employer and employee. And would you give your boss the power to adjust your wages as they thought were necessary? To do so would imply an altruistic trust in others not to abuse their power. Thus, a pure capitalism would be constantly seeing employment increase and decrease as productivity levels change. There exists important reasons why the labor market need not clear, which revolve around the avoidance and delaying of wage cuts by the actions of capitalists themselves. Thus, given a choice between cutting wages for all workers and laying off some workers without cutting the wages of remaining employees, it's unsurprising that capitalists usually just go for the latter. After all, the sack is an important disciplining device, and firing workers can make the remaining employees more inclined to work harder and, well, be more obedient. 
And of course, many employers are not inclined to hire overqualified workers. This is because once the economy picks up again, that worker has a tendency to move on elsewhere, and so it can cost them time and money finding a replacement and training them. This means that inv involuntary employment can easily occur, so reducing tendencies towards full employment even more. In addition, one of the assumptions of the standard marginalist economic model is one of decreasing returns to scale. This means that as, un as employment increases, costs rise and so prices also rise and so real wages fall. But in reality, many industries have increasing returns to scale, which means that as production un increase unit cost falls, prices fall and so real wages rise. Thus, in an economy, unemployment would simply in, uh, would increase simply because of the nature of the production process. A cut in money wages is not a neutral act. A cut in money wages means a reduction in demand for certain industries, which may have to reduce the wages of its employees or fire them outright to make ends meet. This could produce a, an accumulative effect and actually increase unemployment rather than end up reducing it. In addition, there are no self-correcting forces at work in the labor market, which will quickly bring employment back to full levels. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, the supply of labor cannot be reduced by cutting back production as in other markets. All we can do is move to other areas and hope to find work there. Secondly, the supply of labor can sometimes adjust to wage decreases in the wrong direction. Low wages might drive workers to offer a greater amount of labor, i.e. Longer, longer hours, to make up for any shortfall or to keep their job. This is usually termed the efficiency wage effect. Similarly, um, other family members may seek, un, uh, may seek employment in order to maintain a given, uh, given standard of living. Falling wages may cause a number of workers seeking, unemployment to, uh, seeking employment to increase causing a, fur uh, a further fall in wages, and so on. This is ignoring the effects of lowering wages on demand. All right. The, the paradox of, piece, uh, of piecework is an important example of this effect. As Storer argues, piece rate workers are caught in a vicious downward spiral of poverty and overwork. When rates were low, they found themselves compel uh, compelled to make up an extra output what they were losing on each piece. But the extra output produced the glutted market and drove rates down further. Juliet C. Shore, The Overworked American, page 58. Thus, in the face of reducing wages, the labor market may see a cumulative move away from rather than towards full, uh, full employment. The right libertarian argument is that unemployment is caused by real wages being too high, which in turn flows from the assumption that markets clear. If there is unemployment, then the price of the commodity labor is too high. Otherwise, supply and demand would meet and the markets would clear. But if, I, as I argued above, unemployment is essential to disciplined workers, then the labor market cannot clear except for short periods. And if the labor market clears, profits are squeezed. Thus, the claim that unemployment is caused by too high real wages is false. And any cutting these of these wages will result in deepening any slump, making recovery longer to come about. In other words, the function uh, the assumption that the labor market must clear is false, as is any assumption that reducing wages will tend to push the economy quickly back to full employment. The nature of wage labor and the commodity being sold, i.e., human labor time liberty, ensure that it can never be the same as others. This has important implications for economic theory and the claims of right libertarian implications that they fail to see due to their vision of labor as a commodity like any other. The question arises, of course, of whether during periods of full employment, workers could not take advantage of their market power and gain increased worker controls, create cooperatives, and so reform away capitalism. This was the argument of the mutualist individualist argument, uh, anarchists, and it does have merits. However, it is clear that bosses hate to have their authority reduced and so combat workers' control whenever and wherever they can. The logic is simple. If workers increase their control within the workplace, the manager and bosses may soon be out of a job, and more importantly, they may start to control the allocations of profits. Any increase in working class militancy may provoke capitalists to stop or reduce investment and credit and so create the economic environment, i.e. increasing unemployment, necessary to undercut that working class power. In other words, a period of full unemployment is not sufficient to reform capitalism away. 
Full employment, never mind any struggles over workers' controls, will reduce profits. And if profits are reduced, then firms find it hard to repay debts, fund investment, and provide profits for shareholders. This profit squeeze would be enough to force capitalism into a slump, and any attempt to gain worker self-management in periods of high employment will help push it over the edge. After all, workers' control without control over the allocation of any surplus is, well, phony. Moreover, if we ignore the effects of full employment may not last due to problems associated with overinvestment, credit and interest rate problems, see section one of this chapter, and realization and aggregate demand, uh, demand disjoints. Full employment adds to the problems associated with the capitalist business cycle. And so if class struggle and worker power did not exist or caused problems, capitalism still would not be stable. If equilibrium is a myth, then so is full employment. It seems somewhat, uh, somewhat ironic that so-called anarcho-capitalists and other right libertarians maintain that there will be equilibrium, full employment. In one market within capitalism, it can never actually exist in. This is usually quietly acknowledged by most right libertarians who mention in passing that some temporary unemployment will exist in their system, but temporary unemployment is not full employment. Of course, you could maintain that all unemployment is voluntary and get around the problem by denying it outright. But, you know, that's not going to get us very far. So it's all fine and well saying that libertarian capitalism would be based upon the maxim from each as they choose to each as they are chosen. Robert Nozick, Anarchy, State and Utopia, page 160. But if the labor market is such that workers have little option about what they choose to give and fear that they will not be chosen, then they're at a disadvantage when compared to their bosses and so consent to being treated as a resource from the capitalists can make a profit from. And so... This will result in any free contract on the labor market favoring one party at the expense of the other, as can be seen from actually existing capitalism. Thus, any free exchange on the labor market will not usually reflect the true desires of working people and who will make all the adjusting and end up wanting what they get. Only when the economy is approaching full employment will the labor market start to reflect the true desires of working people and their wage start to approach its full product. When this happens, profits are squeezed and capitalism goes into a slump and the resulting unemployment disciplines the working class and restores profit margins. Thus, Full employment will be the exception rather than the rule within capitalism, and that is a conclusion with which the historical record indicates. In other words, in a normally working capitalist economy, any labor contracts will not create relationships based upon freedom due to the inequalities in power between workers and capitalists. Instead, any contracts will, based upon, uh, will be based upon domination, not freedom, which prompts the question, how is libertarian capitalism libertarian if it erodes the liberty of a large class of people? Oh. Oh. All right, section two. We have one more section to do, and then section 10 is done. Um, uh, and then chapter 10 is done. All right. Um, Jan Jan, if you're still here 18 minutes ago, thank you for the follow. Rainbow Jade Monster, thank you for the follow. I am HDN, um, thank you for the follow. And uh, Mattress Mozzarella Ball, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the sub. I was already doing it, Karina. All right.
and then one boom 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 you know what depending on how i feel tomorrow we may be we may all right we're done with the end cap series this week we're done with the end cap theory series this week it's done this week um depending on how i feel tomorrow chapter 11's done it's chapter 11 could be done in a single go and there's a bunch of sections but they're short um so we're 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 done with fucking we're almost we're almost we're so close we're in striking range of being done oh with these fucking idiots um Then I kind of, I either want to do some more Bob Black. Um, Cause I know you guys really enjoyed Bob Black. Um, and there's a few essays in here, right? It's not just the abolition of work, but zero work revisited would probably be a good, it's a good short one. It's really quick. Um, why not call a holiday? That's on, on unionism. Um, what work means and why that matters. Um, after thoughts on the abolition of work. Which is, you know, a chunk. He's got he's got some thoughts on the essay for sure. Ooh, geez, that's long. Um, so I kind of want to do some more Bob Black, and also as I've been saying for a while, I want to do What Is Property by Proudhon. That's going to be a difficult one. I'm probably going to do that in two, maybe two, three parts. Um, maybe maybe more. Let's see what page does this start on. Oof. Um, yeah, maybe maybe four pages, uh, four sections, something like that. Some dumb it is. This is the, this is the collective works. This is the anthology of uh, Pierre jo uh, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Um, so yeah, this is fucking all the long. <laughs> you can't see him. You can't really see him. Yeah, you can't see the the lines. Um, where is? Let me see what what the most common line where it lines up, where did I spend the most time? All right. That's probably the thickest line. What, what is, what is that associated with? Hang on. Oh, it's the, con uh, it's the confessions of a revolutionary section. All right. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to, um, I kind of want to do some more about black. I want to do some Proudhon. Uh, I want to get a collection of theory. I, I want to get, like, I, I do. I, I think it, it would be good for us as a community to have a collection of theory um, that has been read that y'all can point people to on the YouTube channel and just be like, you need to, you need to, you need to listen to What is Property by Proudhon or you need to listen to Anti-Work um, by, you know, by Bob Black, um, you know, that sort of thing. Well, I mean, if I were going to not do the French nonsense on his name, it would be Proudhon, right? Like, it, it would be Proudhon, P-R-O-U-D-H-A-N, right? But it's, it's Proudhon. Piri, 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 Joseph Proudhon. Um, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Yep, it's it's Pierre Joseph, Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Um. So, all right, one more section. One more section. Chapter ten, section three. It it is essentially like two pages. 
Pardon. Um, all right. Chapter 11, so everybody knows it's all natural law. So if anybody has been sort of holding their breath, waiting for the natural law section, chapter 11, the final chapter in the, in the, uh, the Ant, fuck ANCAPS playlist is natural law. Yeah. And Marcus, no, I hate you. Please stop. Um, Karina, I'm good. I'm good. Where did I put my soju? Um, yeah, no, Rev, fucking Karina's been on top of it. Fucking Karina's been a fucking champ in that regard. Ah, oh, and so thank you again, Karina. Um, all right, one more section. Here we go. Chapter 10, Section 3. Was laissez-faire capitalism ever stable? Firstly, we must state that pure laissez-faire capitalist system has, well, not really existed. That means any evidence presented in this section can be dismissed by right libertarians for precisely this fact, as it, it was never pure enough. Of course... If they were consistent, you'd expect them to shun all historical and current examples of capitalism or activity within capitalism, but, you know, this they do not do. The logic is simple. If X is good, then it is permissible to use. If X is bad, the system is not pure enough. However, as right libertarians do use historical examples, so shall I. So, according to Murray Rothbard, there was a quasi-laissez-faire industrialization in the 19th century. The Ethics of Liberty, page 264, from the horse's mouth himself. So I'll use this as an example of 19th century America, as this is usually taken as being the closest to pure laissez-faire capitalism, in order to see if laissez-faire capitalism is, well, stable or not. So, yes, I'm aware that 19th century USA was far from laissez-faire. There was a state, there was protectionism, government economic activity, and so on and so forth. But... As this example has often been used by right libertarians themselves, for example, see, not, see Ayn Rand even on this one, I think that we can gain a lot from looking at this imperfect approximation of pure capitalism. And as was argued in, section, uh, in chapter 8, it is the quasi aspects of the system that counted in industrialization, not the laissez-faire ones. So, was 19th century America stable? <laughs> Oh, uh, no, it, no, it definitely was not. <laughs> Firstly, throughout that century, there was a continual economic boom and slump cycle. The last third of the 19th century, often considered as a heyday of private enterprise, was a period of profound instability and anxiety. Between 1867 uh, and 1900, there were eight complete business cycles. So boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, okay? Eight complete business cycles between 67 and 1900. Over these 396 months, the economy expanded during 199 months and contracted during 197 months. Hardly a sign of great stability. Since the end of World War II, only about a fifth of the time has been spent in periods of recession or depression by way of comparison. Overall, the economy went into a slump, panic, or crisis in 1807, 1817, 1828, 1834, 1837, 
1854, 1857, 1873, 1882, and 1893. In addition, 1903 and 1907 were also crisis years. <laughs> Part of this instability came from the eras of the banking system. Lack of a central banking system, writes, uh, uh, writes Richard Duboff, until the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 made financial panics worse and business cycle swings even more severe. See so accumulation of power, page 177. This was in response to the instability that the Federal Reserve System was created, and as Doug Henwood notes, the campaign for a more rational system of money and credit was not a movement of Wall Street versus industry or regional finance, but a broad movement of elite bankers and the managers of the new corporations, as well as academics and business journalists. The emergence of the Fed was the culmination of attempts to define a standard of value that began in the 1890s with the emergence of a modern professionally managed corporation owned not by its managers, but to, by uh, but by dispersed public shareholders. See Wall Street, page 93. Indeed, the Bank of England was often forced to act as lender of last resort to the U.S., which had no central bank. In the decentralized banking system of the 19th century, during panics, thousands of banks would begin to hoard resources, so starving the system for liquidity precisely at the moment it was mostly needed. The creation of trusts was one way in which capitalists tried to manage the system's instabilities, at the expense of consumers, of course, and the corporation was a response to the outlawing of the trusts. By internalizing lots of the competitive system's gaps, by bringing more transactions within the same institutional walls, corporations greatly stabilized the economy. Now, all during the heyday of laissez-faire. We also find popular protests against the money system used, namely specie, in particular gold, which was considered as a hindrance to economic activity and expansion, as well as being a tool for the rich. The individualist anarchists, for example, considered the money monopoly, which included the use of specie as money, as the means by which capitalists ensured the laborers are kept in the condition of wage laborers and reduced to the conditions of servants and subject to all extortions as their employers may choose to practice upon them. Indeed, they became the mere tools and machines in the hands of their employers. With the end of this monopoly, the amount of money capable of being furnished would assure that all would be, no, uh, would be under no necessity to act as servant or to sell his or her labor to others. Lysander Spooner, a letter to Grover Cleveland, page 47, page 39, page 50, and page 41 out of that letter. In other words, a specie-based system, as desired by many so-called anarcho-capitalists, was, was considered a key way of maintaining wage labor, and exploitation. Interestingly, since the end of the gold era of the gold standard and so commodity money, popular debate, protest, and concern about money has, well, largely actually disappeared. The debate and protest was in response to the effects of commodity money on the economy, with many people correctly viewing the seriously restrictive monetary regime of the time responsible for the economic problems and crises as well as increasing inequalities. Instead, radicals across the political spectrum urged a more flexible regime, one that did not cause wage slavery and crisis by reducing the amount of money in circulation when it could be used to expand production and reduce the impact of slumps. Needless to say, the Federal Reserve System in the USA was far from the institution these populists wanted. After all, it's run for and by the elite interests who desire its creation. That the laissez-faire system was so volatile and panic-ridden suggests that so-called anarcho-capitalist dreams of well, privatizing everything, including banking, and everything will be fine are very, well, let's say, <laughs> naively optimistic at best. And ironically, it was members of the capitalist class who actually led the movement towards state-managed capitalism in the name of sound money. My completionist bone is itching. I kind of want to start chapter 11. Let's see, what is it? 11, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then it's done. Oh, it's so close. It's so close. I fucking, it's, it's in striking distance. It's in striking distance, guys. Um, log in. Submit. I just want it. I just want it to be over. Um, Zippy. I just want it to be over. 
It's so close. We're going to have 11 hours or some shit like that, right? We're going to have 11 hours of just... No, Marcus, don't think I have. We're going to have 11, like over 11 hours of just like fuck and caps, fuck and caps, fuck and caps, fuck and caps, <laughs> right? Like that's, dude, I don't think anybody's done this much on it. Like in all of Twitch, like I'm not even sure if all of fucking YouTube, like I, legitimately, I don't think anybody's put fucking p over 10 hours of playlist together of just fuck and caps. Oh, yeah, well, I, I eventually have to start food and get shit done, Crix. So, um, can you put it on curiosity stream? <laughs> oh, I kind of, I, Karina, to be perfectly honest, I really don't want to, I don't want to do any, redo any of this. There's some that got trimmed off the ends, like the, the last five seconds are clipped. And so the, like the, the end sentence is clipped off and I'd love to like, if I look, I, there's a lot of stuff that I'd love to redo or like edit and trim. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. It is what it is at this point. Marcus, good luck. Um, oh, 100% alien. Yeah. Not of this earth. Uh, <laughs> thank you, though. Oh, God. We're going to do natural law. Fucking this natural law dumbassery. <laughs> God. All right. Here we go. We're doing it. We're doing it. Chapter 11. What is the myth of natural law. Natural law and the related concept of natural rights play an important part in libertarian and so-called anarcho-capitalist ideology. Right libertarians are not alone in claiming that the, their particular ideology is based on the law of nature. Hitler, for one, claimed the exact same thing for Nazi ideology. So do other numerous, uh, so do numerous other demagogues, religious fanatics, and political philosophers. However, each likes to claim that only their natural law is the real one, when all the others are subjective impositions. Now, I'm going to ignore these assertions. I mean, they're not arguments, and concentrate on explaining why natural law, in all its forms, is well, bullshit. It's a myth. In addition. I'm going to indi uh, I will indicate and elaborate upon its authoritarian implications. Instead of such myths, anarchists urge people to, well, usually work it out for themselves and realize that any ethical code is subjective and not a law of nature. If it's a good code, then others will be convinced of it and by your arguments and of their own intellect, and there's no need to claim it's a function of man's nature. The following books, just FYI, discuss the subject of natural law in far greater depth and are actually recommended for fuller discussion of the issues that will be raised in this section. Um, natural Law by Robert Anton Wilson and The Myth of Natural Law by L.A. Rollins. Now, I should note that these books are written by people associated to some degree with right libertarianism and, of course, should point out that not all right libertarians subscribe to natural law theories. David Friedman, for example, does not. However, such a position seems to be the minority in right libertarianism. Ayn Rand, Robert Nozick, Murray Rothbard, among others, all subscribe to it. So I should also point out that individualist anarchist Lysander Spooner also subscribed to some natural laws, which shows that, as noted above, this concept is not limited to one particular theory or ideology. Um, so lastly, 
It could be maintained that it is a common straw man to maintain that supporters of natural law argue that their laws are like the laws of physics and are so capable of stopping people's actions just as the law of gravity automatically stops people flying from the earth. But that is the whole point. Using the term natural law implies that moral rights and laws that its supporters argue for are to be considered just like the law of gravity, although they acknowledge, of course, that unlike gravity, their natural laws can be violated in nature. Far from saying that the rights they support are just that, i.e. rights they think are good, they try to associate them with universal facts. For example, for example, Lysander Spooner, who, again, I must stress, used the concept of natural law to oppose the transformation of America into a capitalist society, unlike Rand, Nozick, and Rothbard, who used it to defend capitalism, stated, quote, The true definition of law is that it is a fixed, immutable, natural principle and not anything that man ever made or can make, unmake, or alter. Thus, we speak of the laws of matter and the laws of mind and the laws of gravitation, the laws of light, heat, and electricity, etc., etc. The law of justice is just as supreme and universal in the moral world as these others are in the mental or physical world, and it's unalterable as these are by any human power. And it is just as false and absurd to talk of anybody's having the power to abolish the law of justice and set it up in their own stead as it would be to talk of having the power to abolish the law of gravitation or any other natural laws of the universe and set it up in their own, uh, set up their own will in place of them. A letter to Grover Cleveland, page 88. My response to Spooner would just be, go read some Sterner, but whatever. Rothbard and other capitalist supporters of natural law make the same sort of claims as, well, we'll see here in a second. Now, why, if they're aware of the fact that unlike gravity, their natural laws can be violated, do they use the term at all? Benjamin Tucker said that natural law was a religious concept, and this provides a clue. To say, do not violate these rights, otherwise I will get cross, does not have quite the same power as, do not violate these rights, they are facts of nature, and you are violating nature. Compare to do not violate these laws or you will go to hell. So to point out that natural law is not the same as the law of gravity because, well, it has to be enforced by humans, is not attacking some kind of straw man. Expo it's exposing the fact that these natural laws are just the personal prejudices of those who hold on to them. If they don't want them to be exposed as such, then they should call their laws what they are, personal ethical laws, rather than attempting to compare them to facts of nature. <sighs> All right, 11-1, eleven, one. eleven two. Jesus, two, two is short. Three, four, five, six. I will fight gravity now. Mm. Right? Um, goddamn gravity. Someone call Cuckoo. It's fucking on. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Fun fact, gravity doesn't exist. The earth sucks. Preach. Um. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Damn gravity. It's been keeping us down too long. I know, right? Fucking gravity. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I know I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I decided already I'm going to do it. Why am I even fucking thinking I'm not? <sighs> Let's see. If I did 11, 1, and 11, 2, back to back now, then 11, 3, 4, and 5, and 6 tomorrow, it could be done tomorrow just in one go. We could just fucking be done with it. I'm so I'm so over this shit. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 11, section 1. Why the term natural law in the first place? 
Now, Murray Rothbard claims that natural law theory rests on the insight that each entity has distinct and specific properties, a distinct nature which can be investigated by man's reason. For a new liberty, page, uh, a quote from page new liberty, uh, for a new liberty, page 25, sorry. And that man has rights because they are natural rights. They are grounded in the nature of man. Ethics of Liberty, page 155. To put it bluntly, this form of <laughs> analysis was originated by Aristotle and has not been used by science for centuries. Science investigates by proposing theories and hypotheses to explain empirical observations, testing and refining them by experiment. In stark contrast, Rothbard invents definitions, distinct natures, and then draws conclusions from them. Such a method was last used by the medieval church and is devoid of any scientific method. It is, of course, a fiction. It attempts to deduce the nature of a natural society from a priori considerations of the innate nature of human beings, which just means that the assumptions necessary to reach the desired conclusions have been built into the definition of human nature. In other words, Rothbard defines humans as having the distinct and specific properties that, given his assumptions, will allow his dogma, private state capitalism, to be inferred as the natural society for humans. Rothbard claims that if A, B, C, etc. have differing attributes, it follows that they have different natures. The Ethics of Liberty, page 9. If, uh, does this mean that every individual is unique, having different attributes? They have different natures? Skin and hair color are different attributes. Does this mean that red-haired people have different natures than blondes? That black people have different natures than white people? And such a theory of natural law, by the way, was actually used to justify slavery. Yes, slaves are human, but they have different natures than their masters. And so, well, slavery is okay, was exactly how that argument went down. And yes, Rothbard supported it. Of course, Rothbard aggregates attributes to species levels, but why not higher? Humans are primates. Does that mean we have the same natures as monkeys or gorillas? Well, we are also mammals as well. We share many of the same attributes as whales and dogs. Do we have similar, na similar natures? But this by is, by the way... To continue, we find that after uh, defining certain natures, Rothbard attempts to derive natural rights and laws from them. However, these natural laws are, well, <laughs> quite strange, as they can be violated in nature. Real natural laws, you know, like gravity, cannot be violated and therefore do not need to be enforced. The natural laws the libertarian desires to foist upon us are, well, not like this. They need to be enforced by humans and the institutions they create. Hence, libertarian natural laws are more akin to moral prescriptions or jurisdictional laws. However, this doesn't stop Rothbard explicitly placing his natural laws alongside physical or scientific natural laws. See Ethics of Liberty, page 42. So... Why do so many libertarians use the term natural law? Hell, why do so many people in general, especially in conspiracy theory circles, use the term natural law? Simply, it gives them the means by which to elevate their opinions, dogmas, and prejudices to a metaphysical level where nobody will dare to criticize or even think about them. The term smacks of religion where natural law has simply replaced God's will. The latter fiction gave the priest power over believers. Natural law is designed to give the ideal, uh, libertarian ideologist power over the people that they want to rule. So, how can one be against a natural law or a natural right? It's impossible. How can one argue against gravity? If private property, for example, is elevated to such a level, who would dare argue against it? Ayn Rand listed having landlords and employers along with the laws of nature. They're not similar. The first two are social relationships which have been imposed by the state. The laws of nature like gravity or eating food are facts that don't need to be imposed. Rothbard claims that the natural fact is that labor service is indeed a commodity. However, this is complete nonsense. Labor service as a commodity is a social fact, dependent on the distribution of property within a society, its social customs, and so forth. It's only natural in the sense that it exists within a given society. The state is also natural as it also exists within nature at any given time, but neither wage slavery or the state is natural in the sense that gravity is natural or humans having 
by default, typically, two arms is natural. Indeed, workers at the dawn of capitalism, faced with selling their labor services to another, considered it as decidedly unnatural and used the term wage slavery to describe it. Thus, where and when a fact appears is essential. For example, Rothbard claims that an apple let fall will drop to the ground. This we all observe and acknowledge to be in the nature of the apple. Ethics of Liberty, page 9. Actually, we don't acknowledge anything of the kind. We acknowledge that the apple was subject to the force of gravity, and that's why it fell. The same apple let fall in a spaceship would not drop to the floor. Has the nature of the apple changed? No, but the situation it is in has changed. Thus, any attempt to generate abstract natures require, uh, requires you to ignore reality in favor of ideals. Because of the confusion of its usage, uh, because of the confusion its usage creates, we're tempted to think that the use of natural law dogma is attempt is an attempt to stop thinking, to restrict analysis, to force certain aspects of society off the political agenda by giving them a divine, everlasting quality. Moreover, such an individualist account of the origins of rights will always turn on a muddled distinction between individual rationality and some vague notion of rationality associated with membership of the human species. How are we to determine what is rational for an individual as an individual, uh, as an individual and what is rational for that same individual as a human being? It's hard to see that we can make such a distinction for if I violently interfere with Murray Rothbard's freedom, this may violate the natural law of Murray Rothbard's needs, but it doesn't violate the natural law of my needs. This is L.A. Rollins in The Myth of Natural Rights, page 28. Both parties, after all, are human, and if such interference is, as Rothbard claims, anti-human, then why, if it helps me a human to advance my life, then how can it be unequivocally anti-human? Page 27 same citation. Thus, natural law is contradictory as it is as well within the bounds of human nature to violate it. This means that in order to support the dogma of natural law, the cultists must ignore reality. Ayn Rand claims that the source of man's rights is the law of identity. A is A. Man is man. But Rand, like Rothbard, defines man as an entity of a specific kind, a rational being, virtue of selfishness, page 94 to 95. Therefore, she cannot account for irrational human behaviors, such as those that violate natural laws, which are also products of our nature. To assert that such behaviors are not human is to assert that A cannot be A, thus contradicting the law of identity. Her ideology cannot even meet its own test. We're just going to power through two. We're just going to power through section two. We're just going to power through section two. All right, here we go. Chapter 11, section two. But natural law provides protection for individual rights from violation by the state. Those who are against natural law desire total rule by the state. <laughs> the second statement represents a common libertarian tactic. Instead of addressing the issues, they accuse an opponent of being totalitarian, or at least less sinister statist. In this way, they hope to distract attention from, and so avoid discussing the issue at hand, while at the same time smearing their opponent. We can therefore ignore the second statement. Regarding the first, natural law has never stopped the rights of individuals from being violated by the state. Such laws are as much use as a chocolate fire guard. If natural rights could protect one from the power of the state, the Nazis wouldn't have been able to murder six million Jews. The only thing that stops the state from attacking people's rights is individual and social power. The ability and desire to protect oneself and what one considers to be right and fair. Or as the anarchist Rudolf Rocker pointed out, 
Political or individual rights do not exist because they have been legally set down on a piece of paper, but only when they have become the ingrown habit of a people, and when any attempt to impair them will be met with the violent resistance of the populace. One compels respect from others when he knows how to defend his dignity as a human being. The people owe all the political rights and privileges which we enjoy today in greater or lesser measure, not to the goodwill of their governments, but to their own strength. Anarcho-syndicalism, page 64. Of course, if it is that there are no natural rights, then the state has no right to murder you, or otherwise take away what is commonly regarded as human rights. One can object to state power, without believing in natural law. Like I said, burning through it. Section two was fucking short as shit. All right, we're done. We're going to, we're going to finish there. Holy shit. All right. We have, we have section here. I'll I'll even show you on screen. Uh, I'll let you, I'll let you guys see. Um, Nope, nope, nope. Hey now, bitch. This is what we have left. Okay, we have section three. We have section four. We have section five. And we have section six. This is this is all that's left. This right here. Oh, fucking A. All right. Clip management. Oh, we're going to finish the workflow. Hang on. Let me turn everything back on. Oh, we're going to turn everything back on. All right. Enabled. Enabled. All right, there we go. Um, all right, Is all that processing done. Oh, wrong one in time. That would explain that. All right, so that's 11.2, that's 11.1, that's 11, that's 10.3, 10.2, 10.1. All right. Uh, well, Rev, we all have our, our, our things that drive us insane, but we still enjoy. Right? Like that's, that's definitely a thing that is a thing for all of us. Um, all right, I need my notepad plus plus. Uh, nope, no update right now. Notepad, sorry. There you go. And no, no, I don't want to play the fucking playlist. Oh, this is all right. So, download and craps 10.1. Download 10.2, download 10.3, download, this is 11.0, okay, you're doing a weird thing for some reason, all right. And that is 11.2. Create upload videos. Oops, that is the wrong key entirely. (laughs) 
And I kind of want to see before I even upload, see if I'm irritated by fucking make echoes again. Let's see. But natural law provides... But natural law provides protection for individual rights from... But now... Are you shitting me? I swear to God, I'm going to murder this... law in the first place? Now, Murray Rothbard... I'm going to murder the Make Echoes team. I swear to fucking God. What is it with this fucking app? I'm done. I'm fucking done with this shit. I'm doing it manually from now on. All future recordings, all future recordings are done outside Make Echoes. I'm fucking doing this manually on computer locally. That I, I'm, I'm done with fucking Make Echoes. Make Echoes can suck my fucking dick. It has fucked up so many goddamn recordings at this point. I am so fucking over this goddamn app. Chapter 10, Section 1. Would pri- Chapter 10, Section 3. What is the myth of natural law? Natural law in the religion. Why the term natural law in the first place? But natural law provides protect. Okay. Yep. Um, from now on, fucking we're doing this via a different way. Where is my um, OBS studio? Um, do I have a record? I need further OBS integration. Uh, media requests, record. I need to test something. I need to test something. Um, all right. I'm a fucking, all right. Um, OBS settings. Output video um, recording path. Oh, I can't do that while while fucking. Um, all right, where's my working drive? AV. Is it right now? It's in there. All right. Cancel. Cancel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. That's tomorrow, and that is it for us today. Okay, I don't know. It, whatever it is, it's not right on a teleprompter. I don't know what that is. I've never seen that. No, there it is. We are going to do Sting, yeah. Okay, but... Okay. The, yeah, I can't read it. There's no, there's no words on it. Okay. Ready? Sure. There's yeah. no words there to play us out. What does that mean, to play us out? It's, it's Sting is going to do, it's a video, Sting video. Okay. What is, for credits. I don't know what that means, to play us out. What does that mean? To end the show? Yeah, yeah. All right, go, go. In five, four, three. That's tomorrow, and okay. we will leave you with a, uh, I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. We'll, no. we'll do it live. Fuck it. Do it live. I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live. To be fair, I kind of feel him on that sometimes. I kind of feel him sometimes. Um, all right. Let me check this file folder and see how this is going to work. Give me one sec here. Um, bam. Bam. Cool. Well, Make Echoes is dead. Make Echoes is officially dead. We're canceling Make Echoes. I can we fuck. Dead. We're canceling Make Echoes. I can we fuck. We're, yep. Uh, Make Echoes dies tonight. That's 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 the long and short of it. Make Echoes dies tonight.
This this bot has irritated me enough. Done. Cancel the plan. All right. I can do it manually on my working drive simultaneously. I don't give a shit. I'm fucking tired of this shit. It is, it is cut off and tra I just wanted to right when I say it. cancel, start when I say to start cancel when I say to cancel, right? Like that's all I need from you. So yeah, we're doing this differently. Um, all right. Select files and craps. This was 11.2 to 10.3. No, wait. How many was it? Oh, fucking A. I've already, I've already like burned out and forgotten. It was down to 10.0. All right. There. Oh. Yep. Um, make make echoes fucking done. Um, I need you de done. I need you deintegrated from my channel. Twitch settings. Disconnect from my Twitch account. Yeah, fuck off. Yeah, fuck off. Connected account. Disconnect from YouTube. Cool. Yeah, Karina, you think so, right? You think it would work that way, right? Right? You, you would. You'd think it would logically work that way. I have emailed them. I don't get a fucking response. It's it's a bot system and a command system that allows for capture of like um, previous what I've done as well as current what I've done. It's basically just a... It's a clipping system, but it's extended way beyond like Twitch's clipping system, but it's got problems. Sunwraps, it's got fucking problems. And like tonight was the last time it's gonna be in use on this channel. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing it manually from now on. So is that, let me, let me just look at it here. Done. Oh shit. It really, it does a thing and then it does the thing. All right. I'll take it. I don't care. All right. Close that. Close that. Yeah. Fucking beta and I'm paying for it. They can they can suck my dick. I've I've had issues with fucking make make echoes this entire time, and I love I love you know, like look I love a fucking bait I love a software development team. I love some beta shit. It's great, right? You know, support them. They're making a pro. No, your product is shit. Your product is more irritating than fucking anything else. So time for it to go. All right. Um, now just let me finish my workflow here on the YouTube, uh, uploads, um, playlists, no, and caps aren't anarchists. God, I would be so happy to fucking close this series out. Make an app and then call it actually working. Make echoes. Make echoes. Yeah. What's your What's your app called? A W M E. What, what What does that stand for? Actually working. Make echo. Make echoes. Fuck these assholes. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Now I just have to wait for these uploads to finish. Oh man, we are so close. Eleven three, eleven four, eleven five, and eleven six. Right. 
So, but they're like nothing. We're going to be done tomorrow. We're going to be done with the an, the ANCAP stuff. We'll see how I feel. Oh, God. Tomorrow, today, today, today. Today's Wednesday, right? Today is my COVID booster. Um, so we'll see how I feel. We may not, dude, I might, I might push this through tonight just to get this fucking done because Jesus. Yeah, tonight's, uh, today is my COVID booster. So we'll see how I feel tonight. There may or may not be a fucking stream. <laughs> that's, that's a thing. <laughs> I can't knit. Thanks for the follow. Um, let's see. 10 twos up. Yep. 10 twos up. Uh, ten two. Playlist. Show R. There's ten two. Um. Yeah, Kaiser. Oh, I'm sorry, Wilhelm. Yeah, Kaiser, it, it's a thing. Um, it's a thing. Uh, Indian military helicopter crash in Tamil Nadu. Uh, CDS General Bipin Rawat and his wife were on board, along with other senior defense officials. Um, I mean, there's nothing explicit in that video, but I'm not going to show it on stream. I should, uh, Viva, I should upload a video dedicated to Make Echoes. This video is dedicated to the programming team over at Make Echoes. Thanks for nothing. Fluish body aches, fever, and headache for a couple of days, says Carpe. Lovely. Just what I want. My booster was like my second dose. Lovely. All right. Um, is ten two still? Uh, is ten two still kicking along. Uh, I mean, I already do. But I'll I'll be I'll be in the hot I'll be in a hot bath drinking plenty of water, Carpe. Oh, uh, well, Carpe, you got to remember I have like an autoimmune driven neurological progressive neurological condition on top of it, so. It's not just like, you know, everyday sort of thing. Hey, hey, about to get my booster soon, too. Hey, Nit. Yeah. Yeah, so my, my, my reaction may be different. Um, you still up for two days after you does. God damn it. I don't want, I don't want downtime right now, but I kind of need some downtime. <clears throat> I need to, I need to like stop exercising. I need to be told to stop exercising. I, I need to be made to, uh, telling me won't do shit, but I need to be, I need to stop just to let my shoulders recover a little bit. Um, so maybe that'll, maybe that'll do its thing. Oh, for fuck's sake, just, just hurry up. Just upload. <clears throat> Moderna. Yeah. All mine are Moderna. Moderna. Um, all right, ten two is done uploading. Ten three. Copy. Three playlists. No. Show. Right. That's ten three. Um, I don't know how y'all have so many problems with needles. It's just a fucking dude. Especially some of y'all motherfuckers like get up in some crazy shit and like ah, I'm afraid of needles. It's like really. Um. Hmm. All right, 11, zero. Yep. 
Point zero. And there was a weird URL to that. Yeah, I thought I saw one. Too many windows. Too many fucking windows. There we go. Done. Recording date. Publish. Yeah, Marcus, I get blood draws regularly too. Well, Wilhelm, I love a good acupuncture. You ever had a dry needling, Wilhelm? Or anybody, really. I mean, fucking. Yeah, dry needling's a whole fucking thing and a half. Um. And then we're going to do 11 2. Yep. Eleven stitches, zero anesthesia. What do we kick the door? It's not the needles that are scared, it's the people who administer it might suck at it. That's fair, son. That's fair. Um I hate needles, but I'm tat with tattoos and piercings. I'm good with you know why? Because the tattoo artist doesn't say dumb fucking shit. Like getting my photos started. What? I've never had a phlebotomist do anything like that, Zippy. Never. Um. Oh, Marcus, it's it's look, it's fucking acupuncture is sketchy. Dry needling is a whole other ball game. Um. Let's see, eleven two. Really? That's the title is too long for fucking YouTube. It's fit. Jesus Christ! Thank you, YouTube. Fucking YouTube, just doing a bang up job these days too. By the way, can we, can we just go ahead and give uh, give YouTube a, a round of applause too while we're at it? Just absolutely creating a shit show of a platform. Even more so than it already was. Which is kind of difficult when you consider how bad YouTube is. Cool. All right. There's those uploaded. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> All you approximately my age with tats or piercings or conformings is rough. <laughs> I, I up yeah, up until this year I had only had uh, the one tattoo um but now I have the piercing and I'm considering more piercings and if I wasn't afraid of like the autoimmune reaction like how my neuropathy might react to another tattoo I would get I would get more tattoos yeah 100 percent especially as I put more muscle on yeah I'm gonna I, I would I would I would I'd get more. They're not bad. Oh, calm down with that Fuhrer shit. It's a fucking... Um, all right, Liver, Wither. Take, you, uh, take it easy, Wither. Be good to yourself, Wither. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd get, I'd get, I'd get some more tattoos. All right. Um, when was that? Oh, geez. Did I not like at all last week? November 30th. So it's that one, that one, that one. So three. Okay. That's not too bad. I just have some catching up to do. Um, Alright. Is everything uploaded? Everything's uploaded. I gotta go needle. Um Judge, what'd you get? Tat 
that reveal before I go. No other. You, if you've been astute, you've caught, you've caught windows and pictures of it. Um, so like double helix, like what am I looking at here? Something along these lines, judge. Or something along these lines. How many how many loops? Only one on the rim, yours is higher. Okay. So Something closer to this territory, probably. All right. Um, I I I will. You know what? I'm sick of Twitch. Uh, I'm sick of streaming on Twitch. So let me show you my piercing I got this year. Um, <laughs> Instaban, Instaban. Ah, oh, um. Oh, fucking <laughs> just whip it out on stream. Here you go. Um, I'm going to stretch mine, mine, mine. Um, here's what I have plans. Um, uh, uh, knit it's, it's a, it's a Prince Albert. Um, I plan on using one of these. Uh, I'm gonna do um, a, a, a black niobium segment ring. Um, <laughs> upstream one. Um, Cause I've got a captured bead right now. Um, so here. Like this. All right, so yeah, Neobium. Um, so I've got a captured bead like this right now, um, but I want a segment ring. I think the I think the seg Neobium. Um, this is I want to want this instead. Um, so it just spins freely basically. Um, but I want to gauge up as well. I'm in an eight gauge right now, and we move it up to a six gauge. Um, and then I think I'll maybe be done. <laughs> That's not, dude, Zippy. I, I've seen dudes with like double and triple zero gauged PAs. Um, here is, here is a double zero. That's a double zero. Okay, I've seen dudes with larger than that as PAs. So, yeah. <laughs> Viva, how about no? Um, I was, so I was sitting in a bath, I was sitting in the bathtub reading Reddit and Somebody was, uh, there was a, a, a fucking meme image about like the ideal bathtub shape. And somebody pointed out that like, that would, that like your dick would be floating, right? Like it was this sort of like sloped shallow bathtub and like, but it would actually like it longer, but shallower. And somebody pointed out that like your dick's going to be floating. And so it was like, yeah, most, a lot of people don't realize that dicks float. And it was at that moment that I looked down, I'm like, Mine doesn't float anymore. <laughs> Mine's got a weight <laughs> attached to it. So <laughs> it's like, oh, problem solved. Um, but yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to gauge up to a, a six and in, in that segment ring. Um, so fucking yeah. 
can't I can't knit. Glad I found this dream. Yeah, I mean, we do politics, we do theory, we do discussion of like an, an, I'm an anarchist, by the way. Uh, we do uh, discussion of like anarchist theory or political theory or you know like leftist theory in general. We do headlines, we do news analysis, those sorts of things. But I'm also a fucking uh, degenerate and proud of it. So like, yeah. <laughs> We, we easily stray into some interesting topics sometimes. Um, <laughs> Tiny Tina. Um, your dick has an anchor. It does. Uh, my dick does have an anchor. Uh, I have no piercings or tats. I like learning about things. Hey. Um, you can pierce and tattoo just about anything. Pretty much. Um, yeah, I, 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 okay. So all right, hold on, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to take us out of politics just for the purposes of this, right? I am ready to weigh in on this. I was talking to Karina about this and I'm ready to weigh in on it. All right. For those who have peni, right? I'm, I'm talking to you, right? If you happen to have the equipment, it makes it makes an orgasm better. Look, I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke up your ass and say like it's revolutionary and that it is like mind blowing now. But, like, take your average window of orgasms, right? Like, you've got your, like, yeah, you know, you know, I got to just rubbing one out and getting it done to, holy shit, man, right? Yeah, this is NSFW advice. It qualifies if you're running a bingo card. It shifts the window. It's like an Overton window shift. Honestly, it takes the window and moves it towards better, right? Your lowest orgasm isn't going to automatically be mind-blowing as a result of the piercing. But I will tell you right now, on average, my orgasms, since the piercing has been fully healed, are better. They're better. I, 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 I was so hesitant and so reticent to come down on that side that, like, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier that it was different— Exol intensity sensation is slightly altered and intensity is increased. I don't know if it has to do with like extra nerve stimulation being that like you're getting movement inside areas that you normally wouldn't you you wouldn't have stimulation. I, I I'm not going to speculate as to the physiological underpinnings of it, but overall intensity increased and stimulation different right so my orgasms are better since i got my dick pierced yeah yeah i'm i'm ready to wait uh, ready to rule on that man so Carpe, I think I think it's something along those lines. I also think, like, given given that it's it's sort of got like a little bit of mild sounding effect as well, because it goes in through the urethral opening, and then it creates more additional surface area in the the frenum t type area. Um, so there's there's like yeah, like I think it's it's got access to nerves that you normally wouldn't be stimulating just from like a simple like dry rub and tug sort of situation. Um, also, like yeah, um, I think it's activating more nerves than otherwise would normally be activated through just pure masturbation alone. But I am, I'm, I, I'm, I'm comfortable at this point having had it, you know, enough months that my orgasms are legitimately better with, with my Prince Albert. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Karina, I, I, it's just, it's accessing things that you normally couldn't access. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah um uh, yeah, no worries Karina. uh so i mean look i'm not gonna sit here and tell you all you should get your dicks pierced but if you're in the market 
you, you guys, you, the long timers, the community members, you guys went through it with me as I had the piercing, right? Like you guys have had the explicit, like up close sort of like, this is what it, what it is to get your dick pierced. If you're willing to go through those first three days and then those first two weeks and then that first month, right? If you're willing to go through that stuff, not only do you get some interesting jewelry and some like fun little just sort of things you can do with it. It actually does it it actually does make make your orgasm better. I can't guarantee your orgasm is going to be better, but mine mine definitely is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm comfortable coming down on that uh at this point. Yeah, the bleeding dick is a thing. The bleeding dick is a thing. I'm not going to lie to you, Marcus, like it's it's a thing. Dude, that day 3 was a fucking nightmare. Dude, like I said, when it happened, made me feel empathy on a level for uh, for women having their periods, the likes of which I've never understood before, right? Like I, I fucking, I had a, a glove and bandages and I fucking look down, I take that shit off my dick and it is just a, it, it is a fucking crime scene. Blood clots and it was, it was a fucking crime scene. There's no way around that, right? But it heals. It heals. Um, so, Zippy saying, can confirm nip, uh, piercings make nips more sensitive and stimulating. Um, <laughs> Carpe making my dick hurt just to thinking about it. It it, it does. It, it's sore there, Carpe, for a little bit. Yeah, it's sore. For yeah. Like, there's, there's no... <laughs> There's a Kurt Cobain getting head joke in there somewhere. Um, but it gets to the point where like literally like, okay, so you, okay. So right now I was just doing this with it. All right. You can, you can just, it doesn't, um, completely heal two months, two months in a week, Loki, something in that territory. Um, to heal to the point where you can rub one out without getting like blood clots shooting out the tip of your dick. Nine days, nine to 12 days. Um, nine to 12 days. You, you can, you can eke one out. It's, it's going to be tender. It's going to be tender and you're going to have to be gentle with yourself a month. You'll be able to just rub one out, but truly healed. You're looking between two and three months. That's truly healed through and through to the point where you can grab the piercing and shake your dick by it. And you don't have to worry about like increased infection rates from like oral sex or anything like that. Two to three months. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it, you, it shouldn't be tender. It shouldn't be sore if it were done correctly in the right positioning. Yeah. Um, it is astral neobium. That's, that's the reason for the neobium. Is that it's non-magnetic and MRI safe? Yeah, you get get the neobium. <laughs> All right, here here here's the spelling of neobium for you, Jesus Rev. Um, general recommendations would still be taken out, would still be taken out just in case you don't, you don't know if somebody skimped some along somewhere along the way. <clears throat> I mean, the guy who, I mean, <laughs> Google, Google guessed Nissan Buium or something, shit like that. Um, did uh, Corey say like I gotta ask you said a captive ring so a specific tool is needed to remove it yes a specific tool is needed to remove it Corey um here Here is the tool.
that is that is the tool. Uh, you can see the ridges on the uh, on the prongs. That's where you get the and you separate you spread out the ring on those ridges, and then you can clamp in from the tip. So yeah, it's very much. Um, it's it's generally referred to as a ring a, a ring piercing opener or a captive bead tool. Um, yeah, like I'm pretty sure. Yeah, if you go to like fucking Amazon or some shit, like here's a here's a captive bead tool, body piercing tool, ring opening plier, that sort of thing. All of these terms will get you. into that territory. So, uh, yeah, Exol, like generally, uh, Wither got it. Let's see. NSFW advice, Wither being kind or shy, Pivot, pain complaints, and Alex Jones. Good on you, Wither. Wither got bingo this time. Um, I mean, it shouldn't be Astral. If it's fully healed, then no, it shouldn't be. Um, but generally speaking, a CBR, you just don't remove. Like, there's no need for me to take my piercing out. Doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> looks like the tool used for close and hog rings on fencing is probably related. It's probably related, uh, Rev, for sure. Um, yeah, I'll have, I'll have my guy, I'll have my piercer um, order my next Neobium segment ring. Because he does surgical grade equipment, um, and I'll have him do my my gauging, my up uh, my up gauging, um, because that's not a pleasant process either. By the way, stretching your piercing. Um, some of you have piercings and have done it. Now imagine it on your genitals. Um, but I also kind of want to do more. <laughs> Um, that was, that was one of my first, it is kind of like a hog ring. Yeah, it kind of, it reminds me of it, Rev. I mean, it's in the plier territory. Um, I've considered a ladder. I've considered a ladder. It would be interesting. I have captive ball earrings never gauged up. This is Carpe. What gauge are they at, Carpe? Um, <laughs> just shove it in and move on. Get it over with. I mean, Judge, to be frank, that's kind of what he's going to do. That's kind of, it's, it's kind of, it kind of really is. Um, he, chances are he'll take, um, he'll take a, a, like a conical, um, piercing. And, yeah. So. Uh, can't knit. I had, I had to look it up what that even meant. So no, um, ribbed Kai Chan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wither. It is. It is. Um, don't apologize. No worries. I just had to. I was like, I don't know what the fuck that is even. I, the first thing I thought was Red Dead Redemption. I'm like, no, that's a P. No, no P in that. Uh, <laughs> If Kai gets the ladder, no staircase, it's a ladder with her. But if Kai gets the ladder, put abs on Kai Chan, please. And <laughs> added Karina. Oh my god, with her. Um Fairly thin, actually, probably 18. Oof, yeah, that is that's like just yank it right out. Like that's like cheese shredder territory, like cheese wire territory. <sighs> Interesting, Carpe. I've never had my ears pierced. I've had my ab, I've had my navel pierced, um, and I've had my dick pierced, um, but that is the extent of the piercings I've had in my life. Um, yeah, if I were 18 and super femme and twinky and shit like that now, still, I'd probably, I'd probably kind of something in that territory. I'd do some facial piercing. I'd do some facial piercing. Um, but fucking yeah. 
if I were 18 again, I'd do a few things. Fucking. I definitely would. Um, I know y'all, like, yeah. I, I definitely was gonna. Oh, Rev, get over it. Rev, Rev, to get over your, t your, your phobia of needles, you need to just go get your fucking, like, nutsack pierced or some shit like that. Um, go get, go get your taint pierced, uh, Rev. That'll get you over it. Trill tats. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up because I don't know what that means. The fuck is a trill tattoo? Like, what's its definition? So I'm seeing lots of photos that are like trill tats, and I, I don't understand what the common thread here is for a trill tattoo. What is a trill tattoo? Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Okay, so the, 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 the thing. Okay. So like this. Okay. I've thought about here. Right there. I've thought about that. Um, yeah. Depending on how much muscle I put on in this next year, there may be some arm tats. We'll see. We'll see. But I've thought about not doing that. <laughs> this is Rev. <laughs> oh, Rev. I can't imagine it's not like, I mean, it's right here is even up against your skull. Like anytime it's skin on bone, dude, that that's, it's not great. It's not going to be great. No, I've thought about that one though. Yeah. Yeah. And also like rib cage, right? Like go down the fucking rib cage and you end up with the fucking on the bone. Mm, not fun. Um, anyway, all right, y'all it's 422. It's time for me to get some food in me. I gotta go fucking do shit. Um, God, I want to go for a bike ride, but I need to take it easy on my shoulders. So, um, all right. Cool. Everybody. Um, oh, just, yeah, just right there. Holy shit, man. Holy shit. Um, fuck it. We're doing that. Oh, you know what? He's not even sitting there. Dan is not even at his fucking, his computer. Um, yeah, uh, Judge, I'm not, I'm not. I got to take it easy on my shoulders tonight and the fucking load on the shoulders from riding the bike and shit like that. I got to, I got to take a night off. I don't want to, but I've got to. Um. Yeah, you know what? I don't care. I'm just going to do that. Oh. Likewise, Nit, take care of yourself. 
Catch y'all later. Really? That's it. F- fuck, fuck the 20 odd or whatever the fuck that aren't rating over. Either way, uh, I'm just gonna rate out tomorrow. Like I said, tomorrow is the rest of the week is iffy. The rest of the week is iffy. Depending on how I react to my COVID booster shot, the rest of this week is gonna be iffy. Um, so we shall see. You know what? The number keeps decreasing. You know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end the stream. I'm just gonna end the stream. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just end the stream. So everyone, enjoy your nights. Find your own way to uh, other streamers if that's what you want to do. Uh, otherwise, sleep well, rest well, fucking have a good rest of your day. Um, and yeah, I'll see you either later today or something in Discord. Either way. Bye. Catch y'all later.